first of all, thanks a lot for coming on here, man. We haven't talked in a while, but the thing I always remember about you is you were like this hard charger and great operator as far as I as far as I knew, as far as I saw. But you were also just super funny and super like fun to be around. I mean, every time we interacted was like uh, it was a it was a blast. So um, yeah, I just want to say thanks for coming on. Appreciate it, man. I'm happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, yeah. So let's get started. Let's. Uh, I, I was reading through your bio and I just saw like I mean, it, like I said before before we got on here, it's just jam packed with gems of awesomeness. So let's dig right in. And, uh, you, you can start like with your um, your childhood. Uh, yeah, just go from there. So like, I, yeah, everybody kind of says like um, they're they're catalyst to, to prompt them to go into the military. So like, what was that for you? What, what uh, what caused you to, to make that choice? So kind of twofold, right? Um, number one, my grandfather, you know, World War II, Battle of the Bulge veteran. My dad was a Vietnam helicopter pilot. Mom was an Air Force nurse. My brother, uh, my eldest brother, went into the Army and then has recently cross-trained to become a TAC-P. My other brother went into the Air Force. That. Yeah, so uh, there was that. And then, uh, you know, I think my uh, class rank in high school was like uh, 152 out of 153. So... Uh, <laughs> options weren't exactly uh, presenting themselves. We'll put it that way. <laughs> right. <laughs> so and, then, uh, did you get right into a tech career field, or did you did you have that guaranteed, or did you have to go to basic first? And then, you know, a lot of guys. There's a couple different paths people take, and yeah, which one was yours? So I did the uh, open general. Um, was going to do either PGA or combat control, or whatever. Um, of course, you know, got down to tech school. Passed the initial test, didn't get very much further after that because I just can't swim fast because I'm a little right. bit of a husky guy. <laughs> uh, and uh, yeah, so then Master Argonne comes along and I swear that dude could sell uh, popsicles to, you know, a woman wearing white gloves. You know, uh, <laughs> he's like, hey, man, you like uh, Florida? I'm like, yeah, I like Florida. He's like, you're going to spring break. I'm like, of course I have. He's like, you're going to pay my city? I'm like, yeah. And he's like, cool, sign this. And I'm like, all right. And I took PT <laughs> test and off I, off I went. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Uh, do you remember who that was? Who was the recruiter back then? Mass Sergeant Gardner. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. He was an instructor uh, when I was going through tech school. Uh, yeah, he's a he's a great dude. Um, yeah. So then, tell me about that. So I I know you went. You have an interaction with another guest I've had on a good buddy of ours, uh, Brandy. Um, so the six six eighty second was your first assignment at a tech school. Yeah, so I uh, completed tech school in just a shade under nine months. I was a Falcon Hawk Eagle. Uh, okay. Yeah. Do you want to go into uh, that at all, or is that yeah, better I mean, left well, unsaid? No, block four, uh, the first time I uh, found out I'm not quite a good land navigator, you know, uh, growing up uh, in, you know, suburban Boston, not a lot of woods right. to walk through. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, and then I got two days from graduation, uh, got caught sneaking out of the dorms or something. It was something stupid, and then I got a day one recycle. So I, had, oh, uh, I was on details all the way through, had to go through the field again. And uh, yeah, so I wound up going to the field three times while I was in tech school. So that was, that was, that was a gem. You yeah, get I your get money's to, worth uh, on that. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> so I get to sh I show up at Shaw in South Carolina and like one of the first dudes I talked to is like, hey man, how come you're not wearing your bubble? I'm like, what are you talking about, dude? They're like, oh, you're doing to scuba school out of, out of tech school. And I'm like, absolutely not. <laughs> you know, and uh, <laughs> Yeah, so, uh, yeah, I met my first supervisor, Brandy. Uh, you know, we, we were all to get there together. Um, probably uh, didn't make the best going as a troop, you know? Uh, <laughs> so about a week after we met, he uh, came banging my door down. Uh, you know, it was like 11 o'clock or something, and I had gone out the night before, and I had seen him, whatever. Uh, he's like, what are you doing? You know, he's like, you have, you know, I remember I like peeked open the curtains, like, oh, crap, that's my boss open the door. He's like, you get 30 seconds to get in my Jeep and get dressed. I was like, Oh boy, this isn't going to be good. <laughs> a little bit. I know what, you know, August in South Carolina, he has zipped up all the windows in his Jeep, turned the heater on. Uh, and it was about a 15 minute ride to the shop. So by the time we get there, you know, I'm like, I got a little banged up the night before I'm just sweating. And he's like, right. Hey man, you get two choices. You can go in to see the first sergeant right now, or you can, uh, you can go wash the vehicles for a month every Friday. I'm like, I will take option two. <laughs> Ran out to the motor pool and just wound up like throwing my guts up. Uh, so, but yeah, that was like yeah. one of my first interactions with Brandy. You know, it's funny you mentioned that because I, I talked to a lot of guys on here that like back in the day, that kind of punishment was always better than getting paperwork or official, you know, Air Force uh, punishment. You know, and I, you know, I've sanded and painted my fair share of jerry cans and you know wash and wax stanley vidmar lockers and so I, it's just it's great these supervisors that like kind of see in us the potential they see 
we're kind of knuckleheads in the beginning, but they're like, you know, like this guy's going to be good eventually. So I'm not going to trust him down. Yeah. Yeah. So, so what happened? So yeah, go from there. What, yeah. What? So you went to Southern Watch uh, from uh, the 682nd. Is that right? Yes. Yeah, so that was like the uh, that was the best kept secret ever because you have mixed Fox and like, hey, who's who's up for you know reenlistment? So we'd kick you over there. She'd get a tax free and reenlistment. So it was kind of a good deal. Nice. Um, yeah, I got back uh, from that trip September 7, 2001. Uh, you know, so obviously four days later it happened. So I get, you know, phone calls from on my block leave or whatever. And you know, it's like, hey, what, you know, what's happening? When are you leaving? And I'm like, you know, my wife at the time was like, what are you talking about? <laughs> what are you leaving again? I'm like, I have no idea. Every time I turn on the TV, so I turn on the TV, whatever. I was like, oh, crap. I called my unit. And they're like, I was like, yeah, you, you'll be fine, whatever. Uh, so then we went on leave for I think it was Thanksgiving or Christmas. I think it was Christmas. Got recalled off of leave and then spent, started my uh, journey around the world to get to Kuwait. So it was a huh. very interesting uh, journey. We loaded C5 at Shaw and then flew almost 15 days west to get to Kuwait. It was what was the deal? Uh, I don't know. They, so whoever the logistician was, was like, oh yeah, they can hop on this plane. We can get them all in one flight. And we just started going west. So we had Travis. Hawaii, Guam, Diego, Thailand. Jeez, I don't remember where else. I think that was like pretty much the highlights. But you know, like you know, one of the days we landed in Guam, plane hits the ground, the emergency doors, both of them fall in. This dude's sitting in the rows, so we're like, oh, this is awesome. You know, this is that like you know we've broken down three times before. Like this plane's never gonna make it. <laughs> uh, so they they fix that. We land in Thailand, breaks again, <clears throat> and I remember we were sitting in the bar in Thailand. Uh, you know, just drinking at the airport and the little guy that was there had gone to sleep with a blanket on, we just put money on the counter going behind him, getting beers and stuff. <laughs> and uh, like, all right, it's time to go. So we like start piling up to the plane and all of us like looking because the dude on the, on those stilts or whatever uh, scaffolding, he's like pouring some, pouring something into the engine, doing something to the engine as we're going like, hurry up, you guys are going to load up. We don't get out of here in the next 45 minutes. We'll be stuck here a week for the air show. And we're like, well, let's just get stuck here then. <laughs> right. It didn't, didn't work out. So, oh yeah and, every time we ever took a c5 anywhere it always broke i don't know what the deal was with those planes i don't know if it was by design because they wanted to like you said extend their their trip or what but yeah every single time they broke down somewhere cool and it was never they would never break down at like fort bragg or you know somewhere like that it was always like spain or you know someplace cool that they could hang out yeah for sure yeah. <laughs> um yeah then, awesome. that, and then uh you know i went to uh kandahar uh, that first time so that was february of 02 Felt like I was driving, you know, in the opening scenes of Platoon because I'm like in a C-130, drove my Humvee off the back, you know, it's dust blowing and stuff. You'd see people burning <laughs> stuff. I was like, holy shit, I'm in a movie. Uh, <laughs> you know, and that was my first real experience. And then that night we climbed up on top of the uh, terminal and just, you know, watched stuff going on around the uh, outside of the uh, campus pretty wild. Uh, when I did the C-5 rolling off, that was rolling into Kandahar after we did our oh. combat descent in a C-130. And we're like, what is going on right now? <laughs> You know, in the back of a C-130, the you know, Humvee's like slamming like this. The chains are going crazy. And I was like, holy shit, I think we're in a crash. <laughs> so. Let's go back to, uh, you said there was something about motorcycles. You said. Uh, oh, yeah. I, I can't what remember. About... I don't think Brandy was part of that one. But uh, we used to ride bikes a lot at Shaw. So like the whole shop, pretty much every tech that had a motorcycle there and a few other folks. And we'd regularly go out on rides. And we are on this ride one time. And uh, we, were, we made it to. Lake Watery and back in 45 minutes. And it usually takes 45 minutes to get there. Yeah. Um, so we were traveling at excess speed, whatever. Uh, of course, cop pulls us over. We're like waiting for one of the guys who was going slow. And I hear all these sirens. I'm like, what the hell is going on here? And then, you know, cops from every direction. I'm like, Burr! slide up. Um, the one cop gets the other dudes away. We all sit there and get our tickets written. And then the first sergeant, I guess, knew the cop because he grew up in Sumter. And like, like a, you know, typical... E4 idiot me. I was like, hey, first sergeant, do I get to come to your office on Monday and give you this ticket? And he's like, Brooke, shut up. You know, whatever. And then, of course, <laughs> we get back to the gate. They had already called the gate because they knew it was a bunch of Air Force guys. So we got him up there, too. Uh, so, yeah, it was pretty funny. But, Jeez. yeah, it was like, my ticket was like 135 and a 30. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. So, <laughs> we were doing stupid tacky things uh, as a young airman. Yeah. Well, as we all did. Yeah. yeah. Um. I heard a story about air assault school where uh, you and Johnny did something. Uh... Oh, yeah. So we uh, we get to go to the Premier Light Fighter School in uh, Fort Drum, New York. Uh, sign in. They're like, oh, yeah, your barracks over there. And they hand us these master lock keys. We're like, what? Why do I have a master lock key? 
like, oh, you're building whatever it was. We go over to the building, you know, it's like the Splinter Barracks and um, Fort Bragg, you know, like what can tell me that uh, ISO fact it bragged a yeah. World War II. Same thing like that, but they like converted it into rooms. And uh, we go up to the second floor, like, oh, it's this number. And there's like, no kidding, a padlock, like a pass with a massive lock key. Like, put it in, open it up, you know, like a light bulb hanging from the ceiling and like one <laughs> bed. I'm like, this, that's not right. So, you know, me and Johnny wound up getting, uh, getting over on base at the hotel and, uh, you know, of course, caught a ton of crap from that. And the whole Army guy's like, oh, too good for that Air Force. You know, you're getting that special pay, I guess, on. I'm like, yep, you know it, bud. <laughs> so, yeah, it, it, uh, it was not a good show because we got a lot of extra attention for that uh, all through aerosol school. Oh, yeah, I'm sure you got some extra calisthenics or something. Or sure something. Did. Yeah. yeah, so tell me about, let's go back to uh, your interaction with Brandy. Um, he was like one of the first guys I had on here. Um, so it's interesting to hear about his time at Shaw. I don't think he went into that very much, but um, I know he put you through the paces. Well, Brandy was an awesome supervisor. He was really good. He was my first supervisor, as a matter of fact. Um, you know, he... Uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not the brightest, uh, you know, sharpest knife in the shadow or whatever. And, uh, he was, uh, very patient with me, I guess we could <laughs> yeah. say, you know, and like, and then when he would get really frustrated, like, Hey man, let's do some good battles. Uh, you know, and that's, that's <laughs> how he took his frustration out. So it was pretty funny, but yeah, we had a, a guy there. I, I won't mention his name, but, uh, man, when you talk about, you know, that airman that just does all the textbook things that like they tell you not to do, so that guy <laughs> was the guy, right. You know, um, married the first girl he met, you know, <sighs> She acted up in the trailer park with her mom and her sister. So, you know, you know, that, you know where that's going, right? Uh, yeah. He was one of the guys who rode a motorcycle too, crashed it, uh, got it out of the shop, went 30 feet. So like the highway in front of Shaw has that, you know, it's like a two lane highway with a median in the middle and the uh, Honda shop was in the, uh, on the highway. So he gets into the middle, spins out, crashes the thing again before he even gets it like 30 feet. Come to find out it's not insured. He hasn't been making payments, you know, so like he was oh that God. guy, but. Man, when he got there, uh, we got him good, uh, you know. So it was like, hey man, uh, do a general maintenance. Like, oh man, we're uh, he's need some more oil. Let's get some uh, K9P lubricant, bud, <laughs> and you know, send him to the uh, supply shed. They'd send him somewhere on base, and he went all the way around base to every fighter squadron asking for K9P. <laughs> you know, the next week it was general ma general maintenance again. We're like, hey, these uh these tubes are corroded. Let's get some fallopian tubing. And then the the supply sergeant <laughs> at, at the time happened to be a female. So we called ahead and we're like, Hey, we're sending him over here to do this. Like, just play along. She's like, okay, yeah, no problem. So she sends him to the orderly room. He still doesn't like catch on that. He's like getting another trick played on him uh, from the orderly room. So she sends him to another squadron and so on and so forth. Again, all the way around base, all the fire squadrons, you know, got, kind of got, uh, did all that. And it was just, it was funny, man. He like just never caught on that we were screwing with him bad. And then I think the time we did K9P, someone come out with like, you know, those rubber gloves that go up to your elbows, the splash guard and the, you know, smock thing. And I, <laughs> someone had actually peed in the bottle and they handed it to him. <laughs> but yeah, no, so it was, it was a good time. Show. It was definitely, it was definitely a pretty uh, tight unit uh, there. So it was a good place to start out. And, uh, you know, just, just a lot of fun, I guess. Yeah. You had a lot of good, uh, a lot of heavy hitters there, like Brandy, Vince Fox, like who else, who else you say was there? Jen um, was there. Um, oh Chris yeah. Chris. Was there. Yeah. Oh but, gosh, Boyd, of yeah. course. He is awesome. Who yeah, else? It was awesome when Boyd, Boyd got there is, you know, PT had a whole new meaning, you know, because he started yeah. doing all the dice PT and the card PT and that, that uh, to his credit, man, like he was obviously, you know, not old, but a little older at that point. And man, whatever he put out, it didn't matter if it took him to almost launch, he could finish. It was just, you know, it was, it was awesome to see those kind of dudes, uh, you know, yeah. you know, lead by example that way. So it was kind of awesome. For sure. He was in charge. He was the regimental, um, NCOIC when I was at third battalion. So yeah. And he, he did the same thing with us. He, you know, would do all kinds of crazy PT and it was awesome. I was in the best shape of my life when he, you know, just doing what he told me to do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, it, was, it was good though. Now, like in my year, like I said, Chris Jenner came in. So it was, you know, I got two really good supervisors right in a row and Chris, you know, um, put me through the pace. I just got back from jump school and he's like, Hey man, you know how to like jump. I'm like, yeah, dude, I just got back from jump school. And he's like, all right, get in, you know, get all your stuff together. So I grabbed my ruck. He's like, all right, put all your stuff on. So of course I put it on in the room. He's like, all right, now do it over here. Puts me in a room, in like a, a, you know, closet in the dark. He's like, you have one minute to get your stuff. And he taught me a very valuable lesson. Like, hey man, you always get packed your rucksack the same way. I was like one of those, you know, he's got tons of nuggets of wisdom. He was always dropping, but uh, that was one of the ones that really stuck with me. It was, you know, 
uh, he's like, hey, man, you, get, you understand how you pack stuff? You get to pack stuff for a reason. You get to bring things for a reason, like think through all of it, you know, all your gear and everything. So it's it's one of those lessons that really resonated with me. And then the other one that I really liked from him was uh, he had this furry pink monkey with like the long arms and the Velcro. So he squeezes <laughs> it and makes the noise. Every time you go on a cast TDY, the guy that either did worse than the mic or just didn't did that sound confident, have to wear that out all night. So they have like a pink <laughs> monkey on the front of him all night long. It was pretty funny. <laughs> That guy is great. Uh, yeah. I, I learned a lot from him as well. He, he, like you said, every time you spoke to him, even if it was just like you're just BSing, he would always drop some sort of nugget that was like you're like some sort of light bulb went on, you know. And it's like, he, yeah, it's just, and the guy's been around forever. I mean, he was a, a Marine, you know, back when, in Beirut, and he was, yep. you know, an Army guy, and then he was an Air Force guy. Yeah, just a phenomenal dude. Sure. Yeah. Then you guys were you at, the, at first bat together? Like, uh, or is he, had he already gone? So no, he was, he came from first bat to 682nd. And then oh, gotcha. okay. when OIF started to spin up, that's when, you know, I guess, uh, the 70 said, Hey, we need augmentees. They pulled him back and asked oh. if there was anyone there. So he took me along and, uh, I got stuck over it. Well, I don't want to say stuck. I got put it for, for a third bat. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. So, and it was, uh, again, back, back with Brandy now. So it's funny, you know, it's, uh, <laughs> He was the NCIC of uh, B flight at that time, and uh, yeah, it was Mark, Nick, Otter, Hank. Who else was there when I was there, when I when I first got there? I think those are the those are the names that stick out. But you know, uh, Captain Thompson was the ALO and stuff, and uh, yeah, it was really good. And uh, it was an interesting journey going from uh, ASOC weenie guy to uh, trying to play a platoon JTAC on TV uh, right. in about 90 days. So it was, it was pretty funny. So and then uh, Hank. Thankfully, picked me to be the guy. So it was me, Bickle, and uh, Muller that were, you know, trying out, I guess, for a spot there. So Bickle wanted to go on the first bat, and then Muller, I can't remember what he did. But, yeah, so I wanted to uh, get in touch into Seco there for the OIF invasion. Yeah, tell me a little about, I mean, uh, I know you didn't have many jumps before OIF. No, yeah, so, so tell I me about that. I did five jumps in jump school and then didn't jump for two or three years. Uh, did three training jumps at... Benning during that, you know, um, cause it was, it was late Oh two, like November of Oh two to like January of Oh three or something or, or February. I did that, you know, train up there as an augmentee. I did three daytime jumps at prior, uh, with equipment. And then my ninth jump was into Iraq. Uh, Jeez. didn't quite go as planned, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> as most people know, but, uh, yeah, it was funny and, you know, the jump was pretty funny too, because the only reason I knew the ground was coming up, uh, I hear a dude behind me, <laughs> you know, make that noise. I'm like, oh, I should lower my equipment. And I was so close to ground, my lowering line never got tension, broke the battery box on my radio. So I wound up taping batteries to my radio for a while till I get a new one. Uh, and then 30 seconds out the gate, did another bonehead cherry move. You know, my KDU, you know, it's like when the uh, so Fox, yeah, I think it was 117 Fox, yeah. You know, the removable KDU. So I put Snap Link on it and I was like, oh, I'm going to be cool, man. I'm going to put it on my uh, backpack or my rucksack, whatever. It's a nice clip in here. So as I'm doing that, I'm dragging my chute to the, where we're throwing them to collect all the chutes. And I snap link it in. Everyone didn't realize is I did like this and snap linked onto my static line. So when I get to the chute pile, I just go like this from my uh, KDU and didn't realize for about 30 minutes. And now, now I'm like, oh, my God, what's that? So I wanted the first two days in Iraq, I want to work enough an inbitter on the airfield there. So it was, uh, or on the HL, uh, HLZ, whatever that we uh, jumped into. For those who don't know, KDU is the is the remote face of the radio that we used to use. So you could you didn't have to take your rucksack off and program your your radio. You could do it all from this kind of remote control thing. And the embitter is just the other radio that we had that was um, kind of like a handheld uh, radio that was didn't have an, uh, as much power as the as the big radio. But then I, what I couldn't believe is in, is this true? You got that KDU back eventually, didn't you? Like yeah, so. Um... Not the not the best way to make a showing uh, with Ranger. Uh, my one of the platoon sergeants like, "Hey, bud, this yours?" And I'm like, "Yep, yeah, sure." And he's like, "Try not to lose it again." So uh, they they found it in the shoe piles, I guess, as they were loading stuff. And he had heard me talking about it uh, when we were sitting at the CP. So he brought it back over, uh, which was good for me because now I had both my radios back, which was good. Yeah, no doubt. Yeah, How lucky. Touring, yeah. And then you know, had the uh, almost comic movie pl you know every morning he's like hey which striker at and i hear him from my little hole i had dug and i'm like oh, this again 
it was just, you know, we were the way we were facing on the uh, where we had jumped into. There was a road that came up, made an S curve where it looked like they were driving to us, and then it made another turn to the right back to the north to go around where we were because we were kind of on an elevated position. Every morning, dude, wake me up. Hey, man, he's coming for us. Get assets on station. I'm like, sir. So finally, I lay out the map, like, sir, there's a road. It goes right here, it turns, comes at us, and then it turns again north. Please stop waking me up in the morning. Because, like, we're doing, you know, patrols all night and stuff like that. I'm like, yeah. So it was, like, a couple of hours I got to sleep a day. Uh, so it was pretty funny. And then, yeah, I think I'd, I'd, wrote in, I'd written in the um, thing. Yeah, me and First Sergeant, uh, we meet in First Sergeant Pippin. Uh, so he, great guy. But, man, he come by and he's, like, trooping the line like he should. He's like, yeah, of course, where's your sandbag? And I'm like, yeah, I didn't pack those First Sergeant. Like, I had way too much other stuff. Uh, yeah, like, he's ready to sell me. We get some cover on this, uh, you know, fighting position. I'm like, okay, cool. Like, like again, typical idea. I was like 85 at this time. I push a bunch of dirt up, took a uh, MRE box, wrote in a shark, was like, please don't step on the grass and like stuck it there. So the next day, he comes in troops line. He was none too happy about that uh, joke. He didn't, he didn't find it as funny as I did. Now, just make, making a, a good impression right from the, right from the word go. Right. Wait, so let's back up to training. Uh, the thing I liked about the Rangers is they have a unique um, array of weapon systems. Like they they um, they are very self sustaining with with regard to like taking it to the enemy. But you had a you had never experienced all those weapon systems before. Tell me about the first experience with the Carl G. Oh yeah, so we were out at uh, which range is it? I can't remember the, name, the number of the range. It was like range twenty two or something. They were doing um, you know, just I think it was like Battle Drill 6 or something. So we're up on a kind of a, a ridge with the CP. I'm controlling the uh, little birds that are coming in. And the goose is like, you know, two or three positions down, maybe 10 or 15 feet. So it wasn't very far from me. And all of a sudden, dude lets a round up. I was like, what the? You know, like it's scared to ever look. And Hank just starts dying laughing because I felt like jump. I was laying on my back watching little birds come over me. And I jumped like probably two feet in the air, you know, and he's like, dude, it's cool, man. It's just the Carl G. You're all right. And I was like, a little warning would have been great, man. I think he, I think he did it on purpose. Kind of, quite honestly. Oh, for so, sure. Like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it was funny. Yeah. I mean, Super it's cool. loud. I mean, and that, that same iteration to, you know, the FSNCO again, making the splash. We just, you know, we're calling in the little birds and I kept walking them in closer and closer. He's like, all right, Air Force, that's close enough. You know, kind of thing. <laughs> so it's like, cut it out. You know, it's like a little kid with the in the candy store. It was the first time I really got to ever control him and all that kind of stuff. So it was, it was yeah. Fun. Were you using uh, guns and rockets, or were you just walking them with guns, or just walking them with guns? Oh, okay. Yeah, and then I think the last pass they went like you know directly over our head. All the shells come falling down on us, and you know they're shooting maybe 150 meters in front. Of us. Like that's close enough, Air Force. We're like, okay, cool, man. <laughs> so, yeah, that's crazy with that brass coming down because you don't think about it with any other assets. I mean, we're used to controlling like fixed wing aircraft that are 10,000 feet and all the casings are internal. And so let's go back to H1 and you were going out to the sniper position. Tell me a little bit about that. Like what, uh, what that entailed. Yeah. So, um, this was after I had gone up to take the dam again, you know, like, um, they were looking like, Hey, you, you know, kind of volunteering for people to come up. But again, it was like really after the big fighting had happened and we we're just going up to reinforce and kind of like, uh, rip out some of the dudes that have been there, like Randy and Tommy, they've been up there for days uh, going at it, right? So I get on the convoy, go up there, and um, one of the first things that I do is I get to the CP, and they're like, hey, man, you need to go to the sniper position. I'm like, okay, where's it at? So they point, and there's, you know, the little VS-17 panel, I think they marked themselves with whatever, because, you know, they had that out. I'm like, okay, cool. And like, who's coming with me? Like, no, man, you're going by yourself. And I'm like, I'm like, yeah, but where's my ranger buddy? You know, like, because, you know, the last five months, I'm like, hey, don't ever go anywhere by yourself. Always have a ranger buddy. And I'm like, but who's going with me? Like, nah, man, you're good. Just go by yourself. So I um, grab the soft limb, uh, put it in my ruck, start walking there. You know, I'm walking through open country in Iraq, and, you know, I'm, I'm, you know buttholes, just puckered kind of thing. You know, I was definitely uh, scared as a young E5 because, you know, I'd never done it before. And I knew, you know, I obviously knew there was a huge battle that had happened. You know, there was still plenty of indicators that it happened. So, you know, I, you know, I think it was about a kilometer maybe ish, you know, I didn't, I don't watch the whole time, which I didn't think about that where they were watching me walk the whole time. All right. But yeah, no. So I get up there and uh, we set up there for about uh, eight hours or so. We're scanning like, Hey, we think the mortar's over here. So I set up a soft lamp and I'm just, you know, scanning back and forth, scanning back and forth. Finally, I see uh, the mortar plume go like that from where they had shot in one of the courtyards. I'm like, Oh, Hey, I got him. Like, All right. So, Got some F-16s overhead and 
called in on the uh, courtyard in the building, wound up uh, shutting that mortar down for good. And uh, yeah, so it's funny, you know, everyone, when everyone complained about laser controls as I was an older, you know, older guy, and especially the opposite, like, why do you laser control? It's so stupid. I'm like, you might just use it one day, you know, kind of thing. Right. It's, it's just one of those, you know, so I break that one out every once in a while. It's like, yeah, I used it. I'm mad the one time. So it's pretty, pretty interesting to, to do that for real. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I know uh, Brandy and Tommy were using it quite a bit on the on the dam as well during that that battle. So yeah, it's not every time. And if you're out walking around, it's not something you're going to lug around for days on end. But no. if you're mounted, for sure, bring that bad boy. Yeah, yeah. And no, it was just like interesting too, you know. And then that was the other funny thing about like as I'm driving into Haditha I hear Tommy talking to one of the planes. He's like, "Hey, I'd like to orient you to Haditha bombing range," you know, because at that point, he, you know, in, in typical Tommy fashion, it had gotten that. You know, he was, I don't know if he was like, you know, just that tired or just, you know, had, had had enough, you know, kind of thing. He was just, you know, yeah, yeah. just doing that. And I think I, I heard he gotten like one of the pilots complained about, you know, professional or something like, you know, that guy just got like blown up for like three days straight, like cut him some slack <laughs> kind of thing. Yeah, you know? exactly. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I can't imagine. Yeah, I just, I always, I mean, I can't imagine what those guys are going through up there. I mean, just getting shelled and, you know, getting shot at for like three days and, you know, Brandy and Tommy were both talking about how they got in, like no sleep and uh, man, just a harrowing experience for sure. Yeah, it was wild. Um, and then, you know, I get up there and it was, you know, hey, we're just, we're still conducting cast, but you know, the first, when I get on the still water and was doing cast, I was using the sniper spotting scope of like a 40 by to see the vehicles were hitting it. It was that far away at that point, you know, they pushed them back that far. So it was, it was pretty amazing, you know, what they had done in such a short time with, you know, such a small force. Yeah, for sure. Um, so tell me a little bit about the H1, uh, hoot shenanigans that went on. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, again, I got a little infamous, uh, cause you know, I, I've, I'm obviously a chow hound. Everybody knows that. And, uh, right. you know, so I was taking you know, like main meals. I'm like, Oh, I'm gonna mix this main meal with like this, you know, humanitarian meal. They're like, dude, what are you doing? You know, like, you know, and I'm just eating everything. I'm like, I think you're the only guy that ever gained weight on a deployment, you know, kind of thing. And, uh, Someone got the bright idea because I was wearing Jenner's pants at the time. Because uh, we finally got back to H1, we had jumped in the uh, chem suits or whatever, uh-huh. and I put like an idiot. I put uh, sunblock in my pocket so I could like get to it. Man, when okay. I hit the ground on the jump, it just splattered everywhere. So like my whole chem suit was you know covered in sunblock oil, and it was just gross. So I needed a change of pants, but I actually hadn't gotten there. Jenner's like, oh, I got some. You know, he's like a medium short, and I'm like a large regular, or you know, at that point, so it was pretty comical if you know like a Wee herman pants on it like you know up up to my shins and everything and then pretty ill-fitting uh and then it turned into like hey but you can't fit into thompson's flight suit and you remember thompson he was a really tall guy either so right, right. there's pictures of me floating around in like a you know 28 small flight suit as like you know 180 200 pound dude <laughs> so you know it's got uh that to do that and it was funny it just it was funny too because that hooch we were staying at, i can't remember what it was but there was something about it. We posted up in there, like spray painted all kinds of stuff on. You know, I think Tommy like spray painted like windows on the concrete wall. Someone drew like flowers in a pot and stuff like that with spray paint. We were just being idiots and had all that stuff in there. And then like we were in there like a week and then someone's coming in like, hey, you guys are supposed to be living here. We're like, why? And then like, there's something like, I can't remember what it was. There was something they found in there or like someone had gotten really sick from something in there. And we were just like hanging out there for like almost a week and a half before we uh, wound up getting out of that room. So, what like chemical weapons or no no it was or... like some I think it was just like someone got really sick with like some skin rash thing or something you know like oh really I don't know if it was like a flesh eating virus or something but you know what I mean I don't think it was that bad but it was someone who had gotten really sick and we didn't know we were just hanging out in the building and no one told us for like a week so it's pretty funny jeez and then uh um tell me about Iraqi freedom fries oh that was up on the dam too so as we were you know just watching the town of Aditha. I can't remember what it was that um so Sean and his team come up and you know Ron for like two nights um to just kind of like refit and hang out. Sean O'Neill? And, uh, yeah yeah. Um okay. So he came up, they were hanging out there and then I can't remember why they had potatoes. But they had a bag of potatoes. We could not I can't remember for life me why they had but they had a bag of potatoes. So the next day um, we went down a patrol into the town. So the guys kind of stay in that area with them. We basically wound up stealing like a little propane burner. We found a jug of propane and then found a pot and we brought all of it back. 
you know, and then that <laughs> night we're by headlamp cutting up and peeling potatoes and stuff. And uh, I can't remember if it was Sean or one of the mortar guys, but it was the most hilarious thing I think I ever heard. He's like, you know, inside every rack of potatoes, American French fry waiting to get out and we're making it happen <laughs> as he's like cutting potatoes. I was dying laughing, you know, it's just... <laughs> Just yeah, so we called them Iraqi Freedom Fries after that, and then you know for the next couple of days we made French fries every night, and it was just you know one of those weird things you do uh, on a deployment. Yeah, it's so it's so funny how you know at one minute you're jumping into H1 and everything's you know like you said, or you're walking to a sniper position and the pucker factor is like through the roof, and then the next minute you're doing something like that. I mean that's really kind of how it went. You're either you know, you went on some mission that where you almost crash or you almost get shot and then you come back and you watch a whole season of, you know, the shield or something and it's fine. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's odd. Combat's always been odd that way where, I mean, I think that's kind of, I mean, in, uh, tell me if you agree with this, but you almost kind of have to do stuff like that because if you just sat around worrying all the time that you were, that you were going to get blown up or get shot or yeah. whatever, you just drive yourself crazy. So yeah, you definitely have to blow steam. Yeah. So I definitely, I definitely had an FSNCO like that, you know, every time the, uh, horn went off he ran to the bunker and i'm just like yeah man not having that like i'll let me know if uh let me know when it's over or whatever but yeah was, he was the guy that uh you know, like you said watching tv he had like seasons of seinfeld and i think uh you know that deployment to mosul i think i watched the entire collection of seinfeld like two or three times because uh, we, we just walk it you know when you're on we're not on a mission you just what are you gonna do i almost watch seinfeld right you go to the gym you eat and then you watch tv or whatever and yeah, yeah. so um do you have anything else about uh, h1 or anything about that deployment before we move on to your 604th no, no. ASOS time? <laughs> no, not really. It was, uh, like I said, it was, it was a really, um, it was one of those things where it's uh, experience is one thing you never have till after you need it, uh, right. kind of moments. Uh, yeah. but I was definitely thankful to have the opportunity and, you know, apparently I didn't screw it up too bad cause I, uh, you know, got uh, invited back later on. So that was always a, a good thing for sure. Uh, yeah. It was actually funny cause right after that happened, I think there was another selection or assessment or whatever it was at that time. And uh, I put my package in, I was selected and I had orders to Korea and that's why I wound up at the 604 this year and making that transition. Um, okay. I can't remember what it was, you know, and I think Colonel Human actually written me a letter of recommendation to the squadron, which was weird. Um, and my package was good to go. And I can't remember who was at ACC at the time. They're like, Nope, he hasn't been to Korea yet. He needs to go to Korea. So I, I went to Korea for a year and then that's when I, uh, want to uh, first bat after that okay yeah. just to cut i want to i want to touch on something that people might not understand uh we kind of glossed over a little bit but um when you your your time with the uh, third battalion like most of us when we got to the rangers we had a, a a lot of time to kind of get to know all the guys and train up and know their ttps and and be very well uh ingrained in their operations you didn't have that luxury like you had a very short time if any uh exposure to anything ranger and then you bam you're in iraq so it's commendable to i mean i think it's very commendable that you were able to not only you know just get thrown right in the meat grinder but then do well while you were there i mean i think that's really commendable so i, I want people to understand that it wasn't it's not an easy thing what you did i mean it's it, it was almost harder for you than it was for anybody else i think frankly no, and, 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 and Bickle and it you know, absolutely Mueller. was a huge learning curve, but you know, I can't, I can't, you know, say enough that, you know, guys like Nick Del Bingo, I mean, I think he, Jesus, probably an entire week he sat in front of a dry erase board explaining like how an airfield seizure goes down and then, you know, training me on a uh, little bird call for fire and then taking me out to go do it. And then, you know, walking around base with me and, you know, Mark, the same thing, uh, Brandy, you know, Hank, show me, how, show me how to set up my gear, you know, like. If it wasn't for those guys, like, you know, taking hold of me and just, I mean, they wrapped their arms around me, you know, from the word yeah. go and really um, made it happen. Because, again, you know, they, they knew I was going to be out there with them. So they, you know, did everything they could to uh, make sure I was as trained as I could be. And they, you know, in my opinion, they did an awesome job because I didn't, I wasn't, uh, I didn't go in there scared. I didn't know something. Uh, obviously, there's yeah. tons of stuff I didn't know. But, like, what I did know, I felt, you know, comfortable doing what I was going to do. Yeah, you got lucky. That's it. That everybody you mentioned from Nick, you know, Brand, all those guys are just top-notch guys. Yeah. Yeah. I could see, <laughs> I could see Del Pego like Nat's asking everything, like just just explaining every single thing. He's got that kind of brain where he just sees, you know, like he's just smart yeah. as hell. So. 
No, yeah, you got lucky, man. And it was it was awesome, you know, because the thing was again super patient, dude. Because once I started asking questions, then I'm just like I'm pulling on that thread, and you know, for right, hours right. he was just like you know answering questions, and I was like, hey chopper, what are we doing, chopper? Hey chopper, you know, doing all that <laughs> stuff. So yeah, he was, he was pretty uh, pretty patient with me for for having asking all those questions and stuff. So it was good. Okay, so you had to go to Korea, like we all did. Um, tell me about that. You did some stuff with Seven Special Forces Group. Was that during Korea? Was that while you were there? Yeah, so or? Um, the, the day I got into Korea, they were like, "Hey, man, you just got back from, you know, OIF, right?" And I'm like, "Yeah." And they're like, "Where, you know, who'd you go with?" I was like, "Oh, I went with the Third Bat." And they're like, "Oh, really?" It's like we got a SF because that was the time when everyone was climbing in positions, and uh, it got so bad that dudes in Korea were deploying because we weren't doing anything there. So like, yeah. hey, you're gonna deploy to Afghanistan. I'm like, okay, cool. And uh, I think I spent... wait. So you deployed to Afghanistan out of Korea? Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. That's yeah. great. So I, I spent about a month and a half in Korea, um, got greened up, and then shot shot out to Afghanistan. It was supposed to be a 90 day deployment or something like that, and it wound up being almost uh, eight months. So they kept Jeez. the team kept extending me. I don't know how it happened. You know, there was obviously some people that were a little miffed uh, when I got done, but you know, it was a it was a pretty interesting deployment because uh, you know, the team I was with was phenomenal, right? It was a Halo team, yeah. um, super good dudes like Chad, J Love, uh, Jody. You know, I still talk to those guys to this day, and you know, maintain contact with them. Like, they were that awesome. Um, nice. So you know, we were alone and unafraid out west in Shindan. Uh, so, you know, not a whole lot on there on the Iranian border. Um, yeah, it was just, you know, the reason they put them out there is that, you know, clans were fighting from Herat uh, up north and with some other guys down south or whatever, you know, it's standard tribal stuff. So I guess they dumped a uh, fob out there to kind of put that down. Uh, yeah, so we just, you know, it wasn't a whole lot of action there, but we, you know, did a ton of training. Uh, we got in trouble for shooting, like, 15 javelins or something like that so we had like <laughs> i don't know i guess uh, a ton of the javelins for that area and we didn't know it and we were just tra training with them because we right. had uh you know because we had some downtime and we got them uh the afghanis to drag some old russian vehicles onto a ridge line and then we had a couple tanks out in the uh flat right off the uh side of our compound there so as the 58th would come in we would do live fire training, you know, almost every day. So like, you know, I knew like the times I'd come back, I'd walk on the roof, like, Hey man, you want to do some aerial gunnery? Like, yeah, sure, dude. And they would just go out there and shoot all day. It was uh, pretty fun, but you know, so some of the new guys as they ripped in, didn't know where the fob was. And then the bunker that they built, cause we got caught a couple of rockets and then the engineers like, Hey, we need to build a bunker cause we don't have one on the, on the fob. So we started building the bunker, but they build this like big tube. And then on top, they like, rounded it over but it was like 12 you know it was like a 12 foot tall bunker which was weird anyway but it rounded yeah. off like this and then they painted it this weird flesh color <laughs> and you know of course me being an idiot tack b i'm on the roof and i'm like dude that looks like a so <laughs> me and uh the bravo get a number 10 coffee can out of like you know the chow place put some concrete in it and just slapped it on top and got pink paint <laughs> you know and uh, did that. So that became the mark for uh, all the OH-58 guys flying in when they ripped out. They just, <laughs> they couldn't get enough of it, you know. <laughs> so instead of doing the 17th, I was like, yeah, I'm, uh, you know, just west of the, you know. Kind of thing. So <laughs> became a pretty uh, good joke. Yeah. But, Going back to that javelin thing, I mean, it's fun. That, that's an interesting story because, like, most people get to shoot don't get, ever get to shoot a javelin in their life, let alone, you know, that many, like one javelin is like crazy because I mean, they're, they're kind of expensive and you know, they're, they're not, they're not something you just rapid fire down range. You know, it's, it's, it's yeah, funny. we didn't rapid fire them. We were actually, you know, we'd uh, throw a couple of times in training, we threw thermites in um, the vehicle and then, you know, get the uh, control unit to lock onto it and shoot them off. And we, but yeah, the javelins we had remaining got taken away very quickly because we, <laughs> We put it on the ammo report at the end of like, you know, like two or three weeks. They, every month they had to turn in the, you know, spend X report. And uh, that was, they, they freaked out. Like, you shot how many javelins this month? We're like, uh, we were training. Yeah. Totally fine. No, it was not totally fine. No. Um, yeah, uh. so, but now that was, uh, you know, that was also a top deployment too, because we wound up losing a really good guy. So it was um, one of the um, 
<clears throat> all the Bravos. He, uh, we, we came pretty close and, uh, we, you know, we got to the point where we'd go jogging every day, stuff like that. And, uh, New Year's Day of, or New Year's of 05. Yeah. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, you know, so we go out on a mission, we go on a present stroll. Um, it quickly turned into, hey, we got this guy in the area that we knew we wanted to snatch up. So we go to the compound, kind of soft knock ish, uh, the compound, but go in a little quiet. Dude wakes up, you know, standard stuff. But instead of giving up, because we get in a little gunfight in the courtyard, nothing crazy. But instead of giving up, he puts his 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 wife and all his kids in front of him. So you know, of course, like um, as they're clearing rooms, Pedro gets to the room he's at. Dude just starts shooting, and like yeah. I don't know if he was shooting at Pedro or shooting at me because the way the compound lined up, I was basically standing across a small courtyard pulling long security out the door. He goes into the room and, you know, I get a couple of uh, rounds go off over my head. I was like, what the, you know, turn around and that's right about the time I see Poppy falling. But um, to his credit, as he was falling, he shot the dude, dropped him uh, and didn't hit any of the kids. And they were, you know, packed around him, you know, just, uh, you know, so then after that it was, uh, you know, a race to get him, get him out of there. And unfortunately we didn't get him there fast enough. Uh, come to find out later that, where he he gotten shot in, in his hip, it hit his hip bone, clipped his femoral, like did a right turn and then went out the other side and clipped the other femoral. But he was oh such a God. good runner, man. He stayed alive for like almost an hour until we got him out really? of it because his his heart his resting heart was just so low. Um, yeah, yeah, it was crazy. But you know, I'm you know on the, I remember it because you know we're trying to drive out of there fast. I'm on the top of the truck. I'm just kind of holding his hand. I get sat in the other hand trying to get him to take off. And I think at one point I yelled on that. Uh, you know, I can't remember what the stat channel was the one that's like all over the country. Uh, you know, that, that channel. I was like, "Hey, take off now!" And finally, they took off, and you know, put him in there and haul ass back. We get back, and you know, an hour later, and you know, for, unfortunately, he was, he was already gone. But you know, it was a really tough one uh, for the team for sure because they were they've been together for a while, um, and you know, he basically did that deployment. He's like, "I'm gonna do one more deployment, then I'm getting out," kind of thing. So he was, he was a much older guy. Um, but yeah, yeah it, was a, it was a tough one, you know, uh, to, to take, but you know, it was, you know, it was one of the first times it actually became real for me. Like, Hey, this isn't, this isn't a joke, man. Like pe- this actually, you know, affects people and, and stuff like that. And, you know, I started to get a little more serious after that. Um, so, but you know, other than that, it was, you know, good deployment, uh, you know, uh, but you know, obviously except for that, but it's just, uh, it's a tough one, you know, that, that first time, you know, especially because, you know, knowing I was the last guy, uh, that he talked to. Yeah. Man, I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah. But, you know, overall, it was a, it, it wasn't a, you know, it was a good learning experience too. Cause that team, again, you know, like I've been fortunate through all my career. It was like location, 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 you know, and I just happened upon what I, you know, you know, thought of as the greatest people. And they always took care of me, man. They always, someone was always teaching me something and always willing to teach me something, you know, and like the color of lot on that deployment for those guys. We did a lot of cross training. Uh, you know, everything, weapon systems, medical stuff, uh, you know, some engineering things. And I learned how to like do a bunch of demo charges and all that. So I was pretty fortunate in my entire career that, you know, I've had those people that are just willing to take an interest in me and, you know, invest the time in me. Sure. And that probably set you up for success when you got out of there. Cause then you, after that, you went, you were able to go back to the 17th as a, as a full up 17th member. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So tell me, but tell me a little bit about that when you got out of Korea. And so you redeployed from. Afghanistan with the, uh, was it, was it with that team or was it with, uh, you just, was it just your time to go back? No. So it got to the point where I was playing games at Shindan where I'm like, Oh, I missed that flight. And <laughs> you know, there's only a couple flights a week out there for, um, yeah. to move people. So I'm like, Oh, I missed that flight. And, you know, after I did that about three or four times, they're like, get on that plane today, you know, kind of thing. And, you know, I get to yeah. talk and can hard to check in. And sorry, just like, if you didn't come today, I was going to send MPs to come get you. Like, because they were, oh, I geez. guess the people in Korea were pissed, and I, I didn't know any of that, you know, because I, I wasn't really checking in my unit that often. I would just send an email once a week, yeah, I'm still alive, you know, kind of thing. But they never right. let on that they were, you know, really anxious to get me back. Um, yeah, so did that and redeployed, and it was actually kind of interesting because as I'm redeploying, um, you know, I get fingerprinted and everything leaving because right before we had, uh, I left the guard unit that was. Garden Shinden Airfield was down the road from our FOB. So we go there and eat. We're coming out one day and uh, 
the guards like, hey man, can you check those two dudes out? They've been digging for like two hours. We're like, are you serious? You're letting someone dig like right in front of the fob there? And like, yeah, we didn't know what they were doing. We're like, oh boy. So we, you know, shoot over there, um, come to like the screeching halt. Those two dudes, of course, like stuck forest dumping out of there. Um, yeah. You know, and the funny thing was, is they ran through a field that, you know, this has been, been there almost eight months and I had never seen a run, run through that field. Do you remember how the fields in New Mines were and had the red rocks around them? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So it was one of those fields and that, those dudes were like oh. straight full sprint through this field. Um, one of the dudes, you know, calls a gun. So we, you know, we take them down. Uh, unfortunately it was like a little handsaw. Um, but, uh, so we, we wound up clearing through that, do all that. Um, and then where they were digging about 50 meters away was a culvert and there was a double stack AT mine. So two Whoa. tank mines like wired together and wouldn't you know, the hole they were digging was the exact right size for that thing. So, I mean, but because they, you know, the dude had a saw on him, uh, you know, they weren't found weapons, you know, and those other indicators that we knew um through intel that these dudes are definitely bad dudes just because you know it's things we knew because they were putting out like oh you know someone says they're in this place you know they have these things you know it was like yep they had that they had this they had this they had this they had this and then we found that mine so it was it wasn't like a bad shoot or anything but because we didn't find weapons on them and it just so happened there was a uh, new york times reporter on shindan that day got a hold of it hit the newspaper you know then there's a big protest the next day oh you know you did this to these kids and da 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 and uh yeah so it was a whole 15 six and everything so i wound up actually getting fingerprinted uh as i was leaving kandahar and like you can't really some korean too you clear i mean that seems so odd because i mean i've heard of people just like shooting hellfires at people that do are doing stuff like that you know yeah. and not even like trying to confirm and you guys rolled up on them they squirt immediately so that's an indicator right there that they're bad i mean if they were not if they weren't bad they were just stood right, right. there and kind of dealt with you mm -hmm. and then you find the mind i mean that's just it, that's yeah. kind of where the lawyers get into it and they kind of screw things up yeah there, there there are certain times when it's nice to have a lawyer there to kind of you know say something but i don't know if you're not there on the ground and you're kind of trying to make a decision that's kind of bogus i think i mean i think not you guys but like somebody who's you know, yeah, making that decision yeah. from way back and wasn't involved. I don't know. Yeah, no, it was just, it was just bizarre, you know, like this, you know, I, I thought it all was done because the guy came out, interviewed all of us. I was like, thinking it was good. And then, you know, like, hey, you get to stop over here before you leave Kandahar. I'm like, all right, cool. And they, like literally took pictures and fingerprinted me. I was like, this is crazy. That is crazy. Yeah. But, you know, everything worked out. It, you know, it was what it was. And like I said, you know, I think the fact that we found the mine and everything else, you know, and they, you know, I can't remember if they said their fingerprints were on or something, but you know, whatever it wanted, they wound up connecting to the mine, uh, you know, solidly. So it, it, oh, wasn't, good. it wasn't anything bad, but you know, it was just weird leaving there uh, like that. So it was bizarre. Yeah. Plus all the stuff you went through during that deployment. And then, you know, at the end of it, you got to worry about this other thing. Like you got this thing hanging over your head until it gets cleared. Yeah. I mean, it's the last thing you want. I mean, that's, uh, yeah. I don't think they think about that kind of stuff. I think they're just trying, I think the guys that actually, are that scrutinize kind of stuff like that they don't you know they're not thinking about the man they're thinking about well i want to get my guy or i want to I'm the gonna... optics of this yeah yeah i mean it definitely seemed like, like that. that it is what it is you know and then i go yeah. back to korea spent like another couple months there and pcs to uh, uh hunter and you know just weird stepping out of a deployment like that right back into korea so, i mean you've been to korea you know how it is it's you know it's, it's kind of a gong show when it comes to you know, going out downtown and doing that stuff. So it's just weird to go from, you know, Afghanistan and, you know, getting, getting after it to friggin' being downtown in Weijongbu, just going crazy. All right. Yeah. So. And it seems odd that they would care that you would think that they'd be like all fired up that you were deployed like that. It's not like you were, you know, doing something, you were messing around, you were in a deployment. I mean, you think that'd be fine, but I don't know. I guess they want, I don't know. You know, you just never know how people are going to react. Yeah, it's one of those Korea things where, like, if you're gone for so long, it's reporting thing. It was a, a paper thing where they were oh, okay. fired up. So. so you made it out of there, and then True. you went to First Bat. Who was it? Who was there when you got there to First Battalion? Uh, so Matt was the NCIC. It was uh, Matt, Dusty, Woody, Adam. It was it was some dudes that had been there a little bit, and you know, again, uh, it was funny. I remember the first run we did, you know, because again, I would, I wasn't really working out on that deployment in Afghanistan, uh, you know, right. 
as as one does when you're sitting around a lot. You know, I, I worked on yeah. some, but like not, I wasn't really like in, in fighting shape. I would say, um, yes, yeah, so we get to Savannah. It's like middle of August. You know, because Savannah is just disgusting hot. In the first yeah. PT session we did, five mile body armor run, and I will <laughs> never forget. Like I was dying the entire time. Last guy in, and I remember that they had the little train tracks, and then there was a stripe, and you had to run over the stripe. That's where I was ended the runs. And as soon as I got got over that white line, I just immediately started throwing up and like, <laughs> like, man, you all right? And I'm like, uh, yeah, I haven't, I haven't really worked out in a while. Like, yeah, we noticed. You need to fix that. <laughs> but, you know, it was one of the first things Matt says to me, and I'm like, yep, I'm here. <laughs> but it was good though. Again, you know, like, and then um, Woody was real good about taking me because I started with Seco, so he took me there. You know, interested me all the guys and. Uh, I remember one of the sisters, this guy, Rocky, is awesome. And we, me and him became fast friends. Uh, and then I still talk to him today, too. But there's this private there. Just like, you know, you, you, you go to the company area and like Ranger doing his thing in the cage. So I'm yeah. trying to like introduce myself to Rocky and like, hey, man, what's up? And then we're talking. But this kid keeps like running by and like doing all these cows and stuff. And then like, you know, <laughs> iron chairing and stuff. Finally, you know, uh, Rocky's like, go, you know, do whatever. Do this. I'm like, hey, man what is going on? And he's like, yeah, he, that's, weird. he's just an idiot. And you know, blah, blah, blah. He did, you know, he'd done something like that. to me, it didn't seem all that bad, but you know, the ranger, it was like, you know, the end of the world. And he smoked the crap out of this dude for, you know, probably the whole hour we were talking. And it's just like, yep, I am definitely in uh ranger battalion now. <laughs> so it was just funny. Yeah. And then, um, had a couple deployments with Seco. Definitely a, a good time. The FSNC, the FSO that I had there that time was a uh, guy, Captain G. Man, he was awesome. Just typical, like he was a Southern California dude, but like super Italian. So me and him, of course, got along real well because you know the whole half Italian thing or whatever. But yeah, so we became fast friends. Uh, you know, on a few few missions, we kept you know talking because we're always at the CP. Like, man, we never get to get in the fight. We never get to do anything. And you know, was that one yeah. mission we were on? We, I can't remember what it was. We soaked the place by SR for a while, saw these dudes going from a tree line back to this house. So we decided to hit the house because uh, we really didn't know it was in the trees. Uh, and it was, you know, a couple hundred meters away. And, you know, plan was always just to SFC it after. So we go to the house, um, fly in, fast rope uh, in to the house. We wound up having to do like a 60 foot fast rope because there was telephone lines they didn't anticipate. So we did a huh. super high rope. I remember one of the uh, uh, 240 gunners because he had so much ammo on him, wound up getting blisters all over his hands because, you know, it was such a long rope. Um, so we did that, make entry into the house, you know, nothing real crazy. We were outside the house, kind of pulling security out. And then all of a sudden, you know, you hit a gunfight on the roof. And that's right about the time I get a call from the ISR bridge. They're like, hey, we get a squirter. I'm like, gee, let's go. And we're like, oh, it's, oh we're going to get him. You know, because like they're, we're thinking we're going to, I don't know run this dude down or whatever. So we run around yeah. the house. We're like, could not find Scott. Like, no, you're right on him. You're right on him. You know, cause the ISR guy sees the two of us walking around and we're trying to get, you know, talked on to where he's at. He's like, dude, you are right on him. Well, come to find out the first squad leader that went onto the rooftop had a malfunction. And because he was by the edge, he had no cover. He jumped off and held off and held on to those little, uh, like half walls like this and just oh held on the side as cause of weapon jam. The next guy that comes out winds up shooting and engaging him. Uh, you know, this wasn't a long gunfight, but, you know, there was like two more guys on the roof. They find up, uh, take care of them, going through, clearing the whole thing. And I remember that's about the time me and G walked back around the front and, you know, a couple of minutes like, hey, what are those guys doing up there? What the? You know, he's getting pissed because no one's talking to him. Well, so the dude had already hung himself over like this. And then the other guy that came out was the uh, team leader. Come to find out he got shot through his radio so like as he was shooting the guy the first guy that was shooting at his squad leader you know that's now hanging off the roof the guy from the other side of the roof shot and like it bounced off the edge of the plate into his uh emitter oh my god and it was just wild and like you know it was like, holy <laughs> crap so <laughs> we think that you know like that's that's kind of a bit of excitement for one mission you know like, like, yeah it's, it's gotta be it right like that's that's a punchline like okay we'll, we'll clean this up go home you know whatever all will be great so about you know we're doing an ssc in the house so you know to, of course we go to the rooftop like you normally do just hanging out and then all of a sudden they're like hey we got four packs coming out of the other you know uh other side of the objective because we you know, had two grgs one for the woods one for 
the house because we knew we were going there after. So that, you know, he's telling me where on the GRG they're coming out of. That can't be good because, you know, we already got in a gunfight there. They heard us come. So, like, we think they're coming to, you know, try and shoot us up or something. So, me and yeah. G immediately, like, because we had an AC 136, so we're like, hey, sir, can we hit him with that? He's like, uh, you know what? And he's like, I got a squad over there. You know, I'll just go send him to get him. So, he sends him to get him. Um, and the fireman <laughs> call over and like, uh, so they're like, hey, uh, you know, uh, call sign for the commander. And like, they're uh, handcuffed. And he's like, say again? It's like, yeah, they're already zip tied and handcuffed. And he's like, what are you talking about? So they bring him there, bring him back to the house. Like, they cut the zip ties off the two dudes, and the one dude had like legit handcuffs on. Um, we bring him back, and uh, the guy with the handcuffs was like Rain Man or something. So <laughs> they start talking to him, like, hey, tell us what you can remember about it, whatever. And you know, I'm getting all this second hand, but basically, the dude remembered the schedule of everyone was there, when they came in, when they left, which direction they went, heard a bunch of, you know, stuff that led them to other people, uh, you know, yeah. like key pieces of information and like names and associations. And I think we wound up working targets for like almost a month from what this guy just poured out of his head. Cause he was basically like being held prisoner there. And when we shot up the tree line, uh, when AC went 30, cause I forgot that we did pre-assault fires, uh, on the tree line. So we didn't know it was up there. So we had shot a bunch of AC-130 there. So apparently when we shot, we had killed the guards, but not them because they had them in some kind of like ditch or something. And then after Man. a while, they, they didn't hear the guards anymore. They just started walking. Uh, yeah. So then it was crazy. Number one, that we didn't kill them during pre-assault fires. <laughs> yeah, no two, doubt. That, like this guy had remembered that much stuff. It was bonkers. I couldn't, I couldn't believe it. I was like, holy crap, we almost killed three men. You know? <laughs> but, then you get all that intel off the guy. I mean, it's awesome. Yeah, yeah, it was crazy. It was wild. So tell me about when you were in Mosul and you were doing the uh, air guard or something like that. What was that? What's the story? Oh, yeah. So that was, uh, again, uh, cherry uh, cherry JTAC things that happened. Uh, it was my first mission with uh, Seco. We go out and do, you know, we're on check records, do a mounted uh, thing out. And it was, we were supporting someone else, whatever, it doesn't matter. But we pulled up where we're going. So we go out that little hatch in the back. So I'm just, you know, pulling security on the vehicle, FSNCO is on the other side, pulling security the other way. And I'm just like sitting there and I think we were by the Yarmouk traffic circle, which is stands out in my mind because that place was always like the wild, wild west. So I was IDs going off there, people getting sniped, all that kind of stuff. And uh, I hear these pinging and I'm like, I'm like, hey man, what is that? He's like, you're getting shot at, dickhead. Get back in the vehicle. <laughs> So, yeah, that oh, was, I, uh... I, that, I always hear these stories about that. Like I got a buddy at work that uh, he did the same thing. He would, he would, they'd make him pull air guard and it just, every time there'd be like plink, plink, you know, you would just hear these, these bullets bouncing off the, the vehicle and yeah. Yeah. I, I, when the striker's running, it's pretty loud and that, cause I was on the left side, it's kind of by the exhaust. So you really can't hear any like reports of the gunfire going off or anything. Right. And I guess it was far enough away that I just, I just heard the ping and uh okay let's go to let's get into these merrill missions because i don't i um i either didn't hear about it or i didn't know about it or whatever but yeah tell me about the the merrill missions that went on i know a lot of guys that um have participated in those but i wasn't really privy to it so yeah please let's hear about that yeah so i can't remember this was like geez it like, had been like 07 or 08 i don't remember the year but it was, it was later on in the time that i was at 175 um we wound up surging early to go um, do the Merrill missions. And that's basically when they were just the area we got was, you know, we were just reinforcing the task force that was out there and just trying to, you know, stir things up and get more dudes out, uh, in the fighting season, you know, so there was, you know, one, as we're doing the handoff, um, uh, with Tommy's, uh, company, we go out on a mission. We did a, you know, co-op, uh, they're on one ridge line, we're on the other ridge line. And this is right after I got there right after Tommy again had uh, done his uh, heroics uh, on the oh, yeah. top, you know, so, and, you know, it's funny because, you know, I, I didn't know anything about it, not hear anything about it, you know, and he's nonchalantly told me, oh, yeah, man, we had a mission last week, it got pretty hairy, it was, you know, so we did this and he showed me the video, I'm like, holy shit, man, that seems like it was like a lot, he's like, yeah, you know, you know, in typical town <laughs> fashion, just downplays Typical, it. yeah. Yeah, and, uh, you know, so that, again, that's why I kind of uh, always joke that I'm, Tommy's best supporting JTAC because, you know, he was at the dam, did a bunch of cool stuff. I come there like a day later, like, hey, man, what's up? 
you know, and then again, same thing with this Merrill thing, you know, I get, I get there like, you know, a week later and oh, duh, that's really cool. You know, so we do this mission, um, we're walking opposing ridge lines and somehow that someone got disoriented and the sniper calls out, Hey, we got troops on the ridge line, whatever. So a guy with the machine gun just starts shooting, um, across the ridge line. And I hear Tommy jump on the radio. He's like, hey, we're taking contact from the west. And I'm like, we're shooting to the east. And I'm like, oh, shit. You know, so I pull out my dagger, do a quick slant range cap, and, like, run up to the gun position. I was, like, halfway in the formation, run up to where they're fi- firing. Because, you know, we're all moving to that anyway to get in a position. And I'm like, hey, cease fire, cease fire, cease fire. That's, that's our guys. Um, you know, and then Tommy's like, yeah, man, as soon as those guys – let loose. I knew it was Ranger because it was a, a friggin' machine gun burst. It was like this tight, you know, because like, yeah. you know, dude shooting you like, you know, uh, Afghans, it wouldn't, wouldn't be that well aimed. Sure, uh, sure. Unfortunately, one of the dudes, as they were doing that, because they got down quick enough, no one got shot, but like there was a dude uh, got caught ricochet in his um, calf or something. I can't remember what it was. It didn't oh, hurt man. him bad, you know, and then of course they go to exfil him and Tommy sets like the record for like the highest helo exfil casualty in Afghanistan. It's like, Jesus, this guy keeps racking them up, man. Like, right. I, I got to figure out what he eats for breakfast, it's, you know? Uh, but yeah. So it was, you know, that was uh, one of the Merrill missions. And then I can't remember if it was a Merrill mission or not, but um, so we had moved down to Kandahar and it was getting to be winter at that time. We're working down Kandahar. So it's cold, but it's not like cold, cold. Um, mm-hmm. We get a call fly for like an hour and a half to Gosney or something like that, way up north. No one told us it had snowed, anything like that. So we planned an overland movement, uh, like a 10K overland movement to, to get to the target. And uh, I jump off the helicopter. I'm in hip deep snow almost, like, you know, just above my knees. I'm like, oh, boy. And, and like, I had just happened to, like, remember those gators, those uh, mountain hardware gators they gave us? Yeah, yeah. You, you, you probably have four of them sitting in your garage. And you thought they've never, never been worn. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Never. So like, yeah. I actually wore those because it was like, I didn't want to put anything heavier on. So I started, started wearing those under the level fives with PT gear because it just kept me uh-huh. just warm enough. And I had those low, low cut, low boots. So it didn't let anything yeah. in my boots. So I started wearing for that, like out of sheer happenstance. So I jump in, you know, we start walking, find out pretty quickly, like, hey, this overland movement isn't going to happen. So. Okay. We have the ISR birds like scan a route. We found a road and you know they're like sparkling intersections we need to walk to and we're just straight walking roads to get to this uh, target. And the whole time we're going, it was like Keystone Cups because it was so friggin' cold out. Like it was, I can't remember how it was, what the actual temperature was, but it was like negative, crazy. But it was so cold, the boots that Ranger had gotten issued uh, at our fire right before we left, the soles got hard. And when they got hard, they got slippery. So dudes are like, doing this boom, and just falling down all over the place. And it was, again, Jeez. guys falling all around. And because I had those summer weight low hiking boots, well, for whatever reason, the treads just didn't get hard and I was able to walk. We wind up exfilling four guys for frostbite before we ever get there, um, which was awesome because, again, being the Air Force guy, you know, bringing in a helicopter, I, I'm the guy, you know, roping the HLZ and they come landing right, right in front of me. So it's like a giant blast of snow because you're in front of the helicopter. I'm like, this is awesome, man. <laughs> I think we exfilled the last guy, like, God, maybe a kilometer or less in, before the target, just because we had yeah. to use that, use that jacked up. Get to the target. Of course, you know, after all that, we 100% got into a gunfight. Uh, get into the gunfight in the house and uh, whatever that they take care of that. I'm outside. And cars keep coming up. So I'm shooting the AC-130 at the cars down the road. And then all of a sudden we start taking fire from my left. And I was with, I remember because I was with the uh, side. And this dude, like, he uh, he wasn't very well liked. So we'll put that. Because, uh, <laughs> like, the missions we would do, he always had this little ghetto blaster speaker. And he was always, like, banging it up on stuff as we were walking down, you know, trying to be quiet, getting up to a house. And he'd just be banging it on crap. I'm like, dude, what are you doing? <laughs> um, so we start shooting and then I'm like, okay, so I'm, I'm going to now turn and start shooting because I'm not controlling anything. And he's just shooting. I'm like, Hey man, turn on your laser. Like show me where you're shooting at. Cause I, I couldn't see where they're coming, where the fire was coming from. He's like, yeah, they're over there. I'm like, put your laser on dude. And he's like, 
I don't have one. I was like, oh my God. And he's just like, <laughs> you know, wailing away. And it's like, this is, this is great. Like, this is the guy <laughs> I'm stuck with now. Like, this is actually like the one time I'm like, someone's actually shooting at me, you know? And I'm like, oh, I'm with this guy. This is awesome, you know? <laughs> well, whatever. We figured it out. We figured out where it was coming from. Uh, you know, took care of that. And uh, we collapsed back into the building, kind of get accountability. And then this old man, as we're doing that, sticks a nine mil out the window. I don't know why he did it, but the first arm was in the room he was in. And he just rocked him because I was standing in the doorway like of the room. First time, you know, I was inside the house and the first time I was right inside the room. He yeah. leveled this dude. And I swear <laughs> to God, he hit the ground. And it sounded like a piece of steak in the uh, a common top. <laughs> I was like, first time, I think you just killed that guy. He's like, no, man, he's good. Gives him a sternum rub. Dude starts flipping out again. He punches him again, like, you know, because the guy's, like, not trying to resist because they didn't have him zip-tied yet. Um, right. And it was funny because I remember the next day, we, you know, do the thing where it's like, oh, you picked up these guys last night. These guys are going. These guys are staying kind of thing. They give you, like, the, hey, this is what you did last night kind of thing, like that, that roll-up. Yeah. Um, and I remember seeing the picture of that guy. Usually I had, like, a face-on picture, and it was, like, a profile, but you could still see a giant purple thing sticking out of the, because uh, <laughs> he had jacked him in the eye so hard. But yeah, and then it's actually crazy too, because the um, leaving that mission, we wound up getting in contact again as we were walking out. Our HLZ was planned for like, I don't know, a kilometer, kilometer, half and away. And I finally, just, you know, because we were kind of, it was kind of this running gunfight it turned into, because it was off to our east and then it was like kept going north and they were moving to where we were walking. So they're basically walking towards the direction to our HLZ and I'm like, yeah, we don't want to like walk them right to our HLZ. That's not a good idea. Right. So a couple of commanders like, hey, just bring them in here. And we wound up landing 47s in this like U-shaped area that was just big enough for a 47 in between three buildings. And we had to cycle the helicopters in to get everyone out, uh, you know, and stuff. And I wound up getting on the last helicopter. And it was funny because the snow was so deep, I run up. And when I tried to jump, I got like stuck in the snow. So my hip hit the edge of the helicopter and I'm like trying to pull myself up now, but I'm stuck on something on my kit. And I remember the uh, <laughs> soon starting to like, throw me the rest of the way in, uh, into the helicopter. We get on, start going off. And all of a sudden the lights flip. Like, Why are you turning the lights on? We're getting shot at. And then I see the medic just has a dude by the scruff of his neck and he's douche, douche, slapping him like that. And I'm like, what is going on? I guess the kid had gotten frostbite so bad at that point he was going into shock. And he oh was my trying God. to keep him from coming into shock by smacking him. It was crazy. But yeah, that was all in like one mission too. It was like, it was funny because, you know, when my mission is like, uh, you know, you have those crazy things, it was just like, uh, you know, you go months without doing anything. And then all of a sudden there was all this excitement packed into one mission. You're like, what else could possibly happen? You know, and it's all right. definitely a uh, teaches you that lesson. Be prepared for anything, you know, kind of stuff. Yeah. I don't know what's going to happen, but yeah. It's so crazy too, because the, um, like just doing all that is hard, but you, then you throw in being cold and snow everywhere. It just makes it like exponentially more difficult. I used oh, to hate visible. that. My FSNCO yeah. went, or my FSO went down that night. He got frostbite on nine of his 10 fingers. The <laughs> only finger that didn't get frostbite was his middle finger on his right hand. Of course. It of got, course. It got so bad. His, both his hands were black. Like the medics were like, dude, we might have to like amputate your fingers kind of thing. Like it, it oh. was that bad. And those dudes that, you know, same thing, like black toes and stuff, you know, cause they had gotten frostbite that bad on that mission. It was bad. Um, Jeez. Yeah. So it was like, you know, wound up, uh, cause he couldn't go on mission anymore. So then it was like, you know, now it's like, Hey, you're the FSO, you're the FSO and the uh, JTAC man. How about it? Like, okay, cool. <laughs> I guess we'll do this. So it was, it was wild. Uh, I'm trying to think what else. You know, neural missions. I, I broke my Rover 5 the first time out. Adam <laughs> right. was super happy about that. Because he came <laughs> sure. to us like literally like two weeks before. And he's like, hey, do not break this. Like, take care of this equipment. I'm like, you got it. I'm like, Adam, I never break anything. <laughs> you know, so I do one of those. Sure sure enough, uh, one of the first missions we did, we fast rope on top of, you know, some 10,000 foot hill or whatever. I. I'm going off the rope and I tripped over a rock, go ass over tea kettle. And that, and I had that, you know, remember how you said that little, like little backpack that, uh, strapped to your body armor. Yeah. Yeah. So I had one of those and I had it in there, smashed the screen. Didn't even turn it on once. <laughs> and I broke it. And, uh, yeah, so I'm super happy about that. That was another 
Merrill All Star mission for that. But yeah, Merrill was crazy. Like there was, you know, a few missions where I just, uh, you know, number one, you were jobbing. I never jobbed that hard, you know, out east like that, you know, because usually be right. a mission, you know, refit, mission, refit, mission, refit, mission, refit. But it was like every night it was something, uh, you know. Yeah. And we were going you know, pretty far too. And like one night we got, <clears throat> we wound up looking for a guy. We caught him. Kind of got into a gunfight, which delayed us. And then weather came in over the KG Pass. Of course, you can't fly. So they're like, hey, guys, just uh, hunker down for the night. We'll get you later. Like, All right, cool. You know, of course, none of us had really any overnight cold weather gear. You know, and it was right. pretty cold. It starts snowing. Like, this sucks. So we set up a patrol base uh, on the, what's going to be our HLZ. And, uh, yeah, I remember it got so cold. One of the guys was like, hey, man, I got a body bag. Crack that bad boy open. So we unzipped the body bag. Me and him both got in it and like zipped it up <laughs> and straight spooned all night to stay warm. Yeah. yeah. A lot of stuff happened on those Merrill missions and it was just, it was nonstop. And then, uh, yeah, even, even Timmy and I think Merrill was where Objective Berlin happened too. I can't, that was, that was yeah. Merrill deployment. We had uh, been tracking some dudes. Then they watched it. They thought it was some way station training camp kind of thing. Um, we, it was actually one of those ones where we actually did a lot of deliberate planning. Uh, McGuffey and I uh, wound up doing a huge planning thing for fires and did it like a massive pre-assault fire. It was something like 183,000 pounds of ordnance. So we Winchestered like four F-15s, four A-10s, an AC-130, like a B-1, shot ATACMs, Gimblers, the whole bit. Like, I mean, it was... Oh, my God. It was wild. So then, then we took off and started flying there. Um, you know, everyone's like, oh, you know, you know, HLZ is cold. So we, of course, land. As soon as we land, you know, the one uh, aircraft starts moving north on the HLZ. We we're going to move south to secure the HLZ as the next helicopter's coming because we had three serials of uh, lift coming in because we had a bunch of dudes that were taken up there because uh, Tim's platoon and my platoon. Um, so as we get off the helicopter, uh, some dude was playing possum. He starts shooting um winds up uh private Harry wound up getting hit then um so then we kind of moved to him they get him secured uh pack him up on the bird before it leaves so everyone's like oh man he was good you know whatever so they he leaves um you know sure shit as we're walking again um another dude playing possum starts shooting and i didn't know where it's come from i just saw like you know you see them kind of skip on the ground so yeah, I saw yeah. some rounds skip on the ground past me, and I I got pretty small pretty fast, and that's when uh, <laughs> Sergeant Alki got killed. Um, you know, so he he wound up shooting that guy before he uh, passed away. Um, put him down. I'm trying to think what else. Yeah, so you know now we're at two two gunfights on the HLZ, and we haven't moved 100 meters. You know, and we've been there maybe three minutes, uh, three to five minutes. So you know, you're getting contact twice. Um, then as Timmy's helicopters come in, we take fire from the ridge line to the west of the HLZ, wind up strafing that with A-10s. We're like, all right, cool. And right about this time, you know, we had slowed things down a little and, you know, we deliberately cleared the HLZ and it was getting to be daytime. And so like, all right, cool, let's, let's walk up this hill. We didn't think anything was going to happen. 200 meters up the hill, dude hanging out uh, with an RPG. The dog handler sees him. They all shoot him, but when they shot him, his RPG kind of like exploded. Oh my god! Um, so like the the dog handler and the dog caught shrapnel. We wound up having to walk oh. them back down, exfil them. Uh, you know, and that and we're maybe three hundred feet up this mountain, and it's you know, like probably like a six eight thousand foot peak. Uh, <laughs> you know, so we do that. Yeah. We trudge along most of the day, uh, pretty uneventful as we're going. We wind up. Actually, as we were walking up about halfway up, the patches are like, oh shit, there's a, it was like a dish or something, and they nobody saw it. So they, we called some, uh, we shot Hellfire at it. And I remember the first Hellfire comes off, bin lock, straight down. Shot in, so they shot the next one. It actually uh, took out the gun. There was no one near, but like, we're just like, yeah, let's blow this thing up just in case there's still people walking around. We already had contact a couple of times. Like, this, it's not giving many advantages here. Sure. Um, 
kind of thing. And then I remember the Turk coming and he's like, hey, I hear a bunch of chatter on the radio that, you know, these guys are going to shoot at us, blah, 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 blah. Sure enough, like that ridge line that was a little further west, uh, four dudes like taunting, you know, and then of course they shot and <laughs> rounds were completely ineffective. Yeah. So the sniper dude's like, uh, he's like, hey, sir, can I fire? And I'm like, yep. So it was probably the coolest thing is happened five feet away from me. He just throws his rifle over his spotter's shoulder. And it was like 800 meters away, elevated position. And these dudes are still talking ragtime. You know, he shoots one of them. Guy like, you know, kind of rolls down the hill. The other three just immediately take off running. Silence. You never hear from them again. But it was, it was wild. Like, you know, shot him. It was a pretty far shot and uphill, which is not easy to do. Uh, yeah. On someone's shoulder. Oh so, man. Yeah. So it was it was pretty wild. Uh, we did that and then make it to the top of this mountain. Uh, there was like a little bunker that was hollowed out of rocks and man, there had to have been some people in there because we found one body on top after shooting all that stuff. We shot all that after all that pre assault that you and Mug did. Yep. Yeah. All that and it was one dude there, which was crazy. And then they set a couple of charges in that bunker to kind of blow it up and didn't even make a dent in it. So like, wow, that, that, that must have been where they're hanging out. And they just, in the, you know, as the smoke was clearing, they must, must have took off. Uh, yeah, we, yeah. We totally expected to find at least 15 people up there. And uh, there was no one. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So we won doing that. Remained over day. Get ready to exfil at night. And the whole plan was to walk down and go back into the valley to exfil. Well, <clears throat> because of everything that had happened, you know, and throughout the day, they're hearing all kinds of chatter that, yeah, if they, when they come down off the mountain, we're going to hit them. Uh, we get guys to the north and guys to the south, whatever. So basically, we were hearing all this chatter, like, yep, they got ambushes laid in for us. Like, well, we're not going to walk into that. Let's just expo from here. So now it's like, the first time, it's like, hey, let's, let's uh, get an HLZ going. I'm like, uh, what? He's like, you're a Pathfinder, right? And I'm like, you bet. When I, <laughs> I had gone, you know, five years ago. I think I remember, like, right. the AFI or the army reg number or something you know that's about all i remember about pathfinder school <laughs> so we you know we set it up blew down an hlz um got it going 47s come in touch one wheel guys are running around the back you know climbing into the helicopters barely lift off do that nose down into the valley to catch speed to get out of there uh yeah and that was end of that mission it was pretty pretty nuts uh pretty cr crazy day uh, for sure. Yeah. All yeah that especially after all that pre-assault stuff. I mean, you, and to have that much resistance, even, I mean, and it wasn't even that much resistance, but it was enough to like, obviously, you know, it, it they had some effect. That bunker must've been made out of. You know, I don't know what it was, but it was, it was something pretty strong. Cause like I said, they're, uh, we, we were, we were shocked when we didn't find them. Cause like, we're definitely gonna find a bunch of people up here. There's no way that there's right. not gonna be a bunch of people up here and nothing. It's crazy. Crazy. Yeah. So it was one of those drive holes where you're like, man, I did all that for that. <laughs> and didn't you say you set a record at that point? That was a record for ordinary yeah, yeah, so drops in Afghanistan. That, that, that was a single strike record for Afghanistan for a minute. And I think Woody wound up beating at the next deployment. Oh, he did? Yeah. Like, gotta, gotta one up me, one up and son of a. <laughs> He's got his Harry oh. Potter scar on his arm for playing General Patton. So. Oh, what's, I don't, I'm not familiar with that story. Oh, so we gave him a lot. I mean, we we're obviously happy nothing happened to him, but when he got shot, um, he got back and then we all got back later and then we got back, you know, he had a scar on his arm and I swear it looked like the Harry Potter thing on the forehead, Oh, <laughs> you know, and like, like, that's what you have to play in general patent. Cause like, I guess basically when he got shot, he was reaching up to pull his PL down. Like, Hey, sir, stop standing where the guns are shooting and got shot through the arm trying to get him to pull down. So we gave him a little bit of crap about that. I guess better him than his PL on the face, you know? So. Yeah, for sure. No, it was definitely one of those yeah. things, though. But he definitely caught some credit for it, for sure. So, um, your time at First Bat was very, it seemed very busy. It seemed like you did a lot of stuff. Um, so how long were you there? How long were you at uh, in Savannah? So, I think I got there late 04, and I left right before 2012. Wow. It's, yeah. I found that like, like a lot of guys like, like guys like you and like Mark, and there, there are a lot of dudes that, were, that spent a lot of time at in a, at a ranger battalion you know it used to be like you'd go there for a couple of years maybe four years and then you had to pcs out but man they got to the point where they were trying to keep guys around because i mean at, 
once you get to that four year mark where they were trying to PCS everybody, that's about the time you're good. You know, you're where you've, you've uh, honed all your skills and you're ready to go at that point. So yeah, it's, I'm glad they were starting to keep guys around and, and, uh, and letting them stay to kind of use that, to that investment that they, you know, put into these guys. Yeah. I mean, that, that you hit the nail on the head. I think, you know, about that four or six year mark when I was there, I, I was probably the, the best JTAC I had ever been in my life, you know, cause you just train so much that like things now that I, I wouldn't be able to even like fumble through or second nature and I can spit it out without a second thought, you know? Uh, right right and stuff like that yeah it's pretty pretty crazy but yeah it's funny because i think i had, i made master they had just recoded woody for the ncoic positions so they couldn't recode him there um geez matt came to me because we were betting for whatever it was i can't remember it was like a change of command or something it doesn't matter and in the morning he's like hey man i got good news for you like i'm like oh yeah what's that he's like yeah i talked to um jc campbell we got it worked out you're gonna go be a free fall instructor because i didn't want to leave of course you know what i mean like the, who wants yeah, to nobody leave, did. Right? Yeah, no yeah. one wants to leave. So to keep me around, because they couldn't recode me to Woody's job, because they just had just done the recode. So obviously, if he wasn't going to like let him, I'll oh, pull that guy out, put this guy in kind of thing. Yeah. Um, you know, and there was no other place to put a master. And Matt, you know, found me at home at Freefall School. I'm like, oh, yeah, man, I'll definitely do that. I think three o'clock that afternoon, he's like, remember that thing I told you about this morning? <laughs> yeah, that's not going to happen anymore. You got to rest of Korea. I was like, what? Yeah. So I got Again? the second time, yeah, to Korea. Yep. And I wound up, uh, actually, I think I forgot to put that on the sheet. Yeah, I spent a year in Korea, the 607th, uh, the group. How I mean, was that? Was it uh, just crazy, um, just normal Korea stuff? Or? Oh, it was normal Korea shenanigans, and it was just, yeah, it was pretty funny. Uh, <laughs> yeah, definitely normal yeah. Korea. We don't need to talk about it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> a lot of the, yeah, <laughs> most of my Korea stories and, you know, Matt, everybody, everybody's career stories are kind of like classified, you know, <laughs> like yeah, we'll yeah, just yeah. leave well, it there. You know? What I can talk about is the power wagon. So we had this, I had an 89 Hyundai Elantra wagon <laughs> and man, that thing got the crap beat out of it because the guy leaving, he's like, yeah, buy this car for me. I'm like, I'm not buying your car, dude. And he's like, well, I got to sign this over to someone before I leave. I'm like, Hey, if you don't sell this, don't expect me to pay for it. I'll yeah. sign so you can leave. Sure, sure enough, two weeks later, he's like, hey, man, you can send me that money. I'm like, no, I told you I wasn't buying this car. Right. So because I didn't buy it, like we, I mean, e-braking all over the place. Like, you know, those uh, <laughs> things they have in the middle of the road, like those uh, pylons that are, you know, kind yeah, of yeah. in the street. We just drive into those with this car. Like, <laughs> um, at one point, we were like, one of the guys I pick up every day for work, he'd just run over the car and then get in, uh, <laughs> like took sledgehammers to it. And then all of a sudden, we gave it like this crazy paint job that looked like attack B crest, like rattle cam. Oh, yeah. Uh, and at one point, the only thing that worked was the driver's side window. That's the only way we could get in and out of the car. Cause I had to roll my window down to open the door, to get out, to walk around, to open the passenger door, to let everybody else. Out. Cause none of the windows worked <laughs> and none of the door handles worked. It's it it pretty funny. We had, we had some shenanigans in that car as you can probably figure out. Oh yeah. So then you, uh, so you did your time in Korea and then you went to the 14th after that? I sure did. Yeah. So I was, uh, okay. I actually had, when it came time to like put in your assignment preference, there was a 12th Air Force Sanibel job open. I'm like, oh, cool. I'll take that. So, um, I wound up getting orders to Davis Monthan to go be the 12th Air Force Sanibel guy. And I can't remember what happened. I think the officer at the time was like, I don't think that position's open anymore. So sure enough, it really was, it shouldn't have been advertised. I shouldn't have got it. Oh. And then I got, uh, my orders got changed to go to Fort Bragg. And at about that time, that was when Sean was, I can't remember, was it a fam or ACC or whatever? But yeah. I told him like, hey man, what gives, dude? And he's like, just be glad you're not at Fort Hood. I'm like, and I'll take that hint and pay up for <laughs> you know, kind of thing. Uh, so I went to Fort Bragg. It was uh, definitely cool. Uh, you know, because that's one of those places, you know, it's always baby door kicking university, right? Like there was always, yeah. that's where all the guys that went to the 17th always came from and stuff like that. Um, right. So I PCS there. I think a couple months later, I was the op soup because uh, Rick had got made chief and then uh, Manchester was the op soup. We got moved up to senior enlisted advisor or whatever. And they moved me upstairs, which was kind of funny because, uh, I brought back, I can't remember if it was Valella's tradition or voice. I think it was Valella's. But uh, where you put the the chair mat out and you have the set of hands traced 
in the set of feet trace and it's like choices. Sometimes they're not yours. Uh, so if, you know, so it would be like, Hey man, paper or plastic when dudes would get in trouble, you know, kind of thing. Cause yeah. you know, people had spared me when I was a young guy in my career and that's kind of revived that sure. in there. So I was, you know, get in trouble. Hey man, you have the, you know, the LOR written or whatever, like, Hey, paper or plastic dude. I'll take yeah. plastic, you know, and we smoke them a little bit and send them on their way. Yeah. Every time I would take the <laughs> physical punishment over the paperwork any day. Always. Yeah. yeah so I'm not super eventful there. Um, other than it was kind of nice, um, you know, because obviously Korea was a little bit of a decompression, but, you know, after being at 17th for so long and going so hard for so long, you know, like at the 14th, it was fun. You know, guys were awesome, phenomenal, but like, you know, you just, you know, you're like, oh, well, you know, you're like alone and unafraid. And then right. Mark showed up and then Kevin showed up and, you know, a couple of that Woody showed up. So it was like, you know, like a little 17th reunion uh, between the group yeah. and the 14th after a while. So it was really fun. And, you know, of course, everyone's, you know, a million questions because you were there. And of course, Mark did all the stuff he did. So like, he, you know, he was like the rock star there. Typical 14th stuff, training for deployments, doing a lot of jumps. And that's where Mark and I started messing with each other a little bit. Uh, Cause it started out, you know, innocent enough where, uh, we were doing a full equipment free fall jump and, uh, you know, the boulders started out like this big, you know, right. and the rock just for a little extra weight to mess with them. Cause we were doing a movement after, you know, whatever, um, you know, and I think by the end, like the last rock I put in March rock was like this big, you know, and I don't know how we didn't notice it picking up the rock. Cause I made <laughs> sure to, when we were driving down the airfield, I'm like, oh man, I'll go grab the rock and bring it in there. So, you know, set it in the truck, drive it out to the airfield loaded on that aircraft. So like, you know, he didn't touch his rock. Cause I knew I'm like, this rock is so big. He's definitely going to, he's definitely going to feel it. This is right, like, right. about the six or seven time we've gone back and forth. And I am, it was each time it was a little bit of a one up. Uh, yeah. And that last time, man, like he get in the aircraft, he does all this stuff. He, so he'll get up his equipment and I'm like, he's going to feel this. Yeah. I don't know how he didn't feel it, but he's like, you know, we get to the ground. He's like, dude, I had the worst ride ever. And I'm like, really? And he's like, <laughs> Like what happened to your ruck shift or something? And he's like, and then he like gives me that look. He opens his box, like, you son of a, and I'm like, gotcha. you know. And that, after that, I think we ended, we called knock it off. We, we got a truce because uh, you know at that point someone was probably gonna go a little too far. Yeah, I, I like how he didn't catch on that you were like carrying his ruck for him. Like, oh, I'll get this for you, bud. It's like That's that funny, never happens. Well, he was in that jump, so it was like the perfect opportunity because he was running around. Oh right, a right. Bunch of other stuff too, so it was, you know. Uh, Good. Yeah, we did did a lot of funny things like that. And, and did you guys? Uh, I know weren't you and Mark in, integral in uh, getting NVG qualified like while you, during your free fall program? I mean that wasn't really done outside of like a soft unit. So that was yeah. So Mark pretty actually, cool that you guys were doing that. Mark Mark actually took that up. Um, he got got his wind tunnel time the whole bit. And like you know, you know Mark, you know very thorough with yeah. everything. And man, he had. Of course, he had a binder of things that we're going to do and, you know, all that stuff. Uh, and wound up training us all up, did all the wind tunnel stuff, did the work up, and then did day jumps with them the whole bit. And then finally we get work up to the night full equipment jump. And uh, I can't remember what it was. It was just really high winds at altitude. Like, I mean, really high. Um, yeah. Because, you know, our dip was well off the drop zone, like really far. Um, yeah, so it's yeah. like, and me and Mark checked it a couple of times. So like, dude, this doesn't seem right. This math isn't working. Like, why is it this yeah. far away? Cause it was that far. But I was like, Hey man, get out, get under canopy, immediately turn into the wind and do not turn around. And like, we're on comms the whole bit. He's like the whole jump down is like, do not turn around. Do not turn around. And like, you know, so we're all flying into the wind. We just barely make the West side of the drop zone. And the other guys we were jumping with wound up landing like a kilometer or two off. Cause they had run with the wind for about a minute. And, uh, yeah, it was, it was funny because, uh, you know, testament to Mark and his training and, you know, wherewithal says, you know, definitely oh, yeah. a, a very thorough guy when it comes to that stuff. But Oh, for sure. Yeah. 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 He, wanted to, he wanted to teach me a lot, you know, because I, I went to free fall JM after I was at Brad. So he, you know, kind of tucked me under his wing and showed me the ways. Yeah. And then, you know, that was the only, I mean, that was really the only thing that happened at Brad was, you know, some funny stories of jump stuff. We had a new kid, again, just got our free fall JM. We're at a toy drop. We're jumping Romanians, Botswanans, and Malaysians. And uh, we're jumping on McCall. Where was this? At Bragg. For oh, at McCall? Oh, okay. So he gets his wins, whatever. I check it in the morning because I am i wasn't evaling him, but I think he, no, he just passed the eval. So it was his first jump with no oversight. Uh, 
So we compared wins because of just, you know, things you do, right? So we compared wins like, okay, cool, man. I didn't think anything of it until we start ready, getting ready to load because our chalk slipped for a while. And then we jumped at like two o'clock. Dude never recalced. And he did his calc at like six in the morning. So oh my God. obviously not a good thing, right? Um, <laughs> I recalced. And I was like, all right, cool. And but I didn't talk to him. So like before it happened, like we were doing a bunch of different stuff. So I never got a chance to like link up with him to go, hey man, the spot shifted. Um, so we're getting out, we get out of the aircraft, he lets him go. I'm like, what is he doing? And I wait like 10 seconds, I go. And then there was Malaysians, Botswanans, and Romanians all over a trailer park, uh, south of McCall. And I'm like, oh shit, this is it. This is where Red Dawn happens. Some dude. It's going to come out of the trailer with a shotgun and be like, they're invading, you know, I was, like, I was like having panic attacks. And then the Romanian guy too, um, he, uh, that next jump, we jumped and then I came in, he's the jump master, but tell him when to go all right. kind of thing. So because everyone wanted to get yeah. the Romanian wing. So I'm like, all right, cool. We push everyone out. Me and him, the last one's out. He waits a couple seconds after I jump, I pull and I see like this go by me. I was like, what the? We get on the ground. I'm like, hey, dude, what was that all about? You almost like flew through my chute. Oh, sorry. I thought it was Mita's because we gave him a U.S. <laughs> uh, yeah, altimeter. Okay. And I'm like, yeah. how could you, how could you like uh, confuse that? Like thinking that was meters. And he's like, oh, I thought it was right, meters. Right, right. Because, you know, he sees like four and he thinks it's 4,000 meters. I don't know, maybe muscle memory or something. But... So did his, uh, did his Cypress fire or did he pull? No, no, I mean, no. So he, he pulled. We, we pulled at the right altitude. So he was right in between where full altitude and where we're going to, the cyclists are going to fire. But oh, I had okay. already pulled and I was out running canopy. Uh, yeah, yeah. And when he came screaming by, because he had waited just long enough uh, before he jumped. It was wild. Jeez. Now, so yeah, and then, I mean, the only deployment I did uh, out of Fort Bragg was for New Dawn. We did that and then I did about nine month grip there. It was pretty, uh, pretty interesting time because, you know, we had different strike cells going around. So we had three strike, strike cells we were running. So I, that's the opposite there. I was just, flying from country to country on embassy air, uh, you know, checking on the guys and stuff. So it's it pretty funny, you know, like in the morning you're in Baghdad, you know, just watching kill cam and that afternoon you're in Erbil and you go downtown for dinner and then fly home. <laughs> yeah. And then interesting call. I got one of the young airmen, uh, had brought a device with him. Uh, we moved, so we we're moving dudes around so they didn't all get stuck at like, cause Erbil was kind of crappy living situation, but you could go downtown um back that was real nice because you're on the embassy like living in apartments and then uh um, oh, nice. the other place we're at was pretty decent too so we were trying to rotate guys around so they got like a break and stuff and one dude gets the customs in jordan and we get the phone call like hey uh we get a we get a problem here like, yeah what's that and like um uh, we got one of your guys and uh so basically got hemmed up in customs in jordan for having a fleshlight <laughs> yeah was awkward yeah, to them like trying to explain to the commander like hey we got it it's cool they're gonna let him go but he's like yeah but what, are we, what did he do and i'm like i don't worry about it sir it's fine everything's fine it's fine like how do you how do you explain that to someone it's just awkward yeah yeah, so it was yeah. It's like we got it under control don't worry about yeah, it it's, it's yeah, fine yeah. everything's fine nothing to see here nothing to see here yeah. so. but you guys your guys dropped a bunch of ordnance over there that time didn't they yeah so i think through that deployment, the three strike cells, they dropped something like 6 million pounds of ordnance. There was Jeez. one kid, the senior airman, he, he dropped almost a million pounds himself. Like on his, yeah. his first deployment ever. Crazy, right? Like, can you yeah. imagine your first deployment? Like, I'm going to drop a million pounds of ordnance. I mean, granted, it was kill cam stuff, but like. like Still, I mean, yeah. that's man, Like that's all crazy. day, every day. These dudes were like on, you know, eight hour shifts all day long. Cleared up, cleared up, cleared up, cleared up, cleared up. It was nuts. And like, it, it and was it just like, uh, and just targets that came in and they were just like, uh, yeah. So you had, you know, like you were, it was a partner force thing and then they would nominate targets. We'd be watching targets. Uh, and then you had, um, like a strike authority. It was like a one star, whatever. Yeah. Um, yeah so yeah. They, it would go to like the Iraqi side, the Iraqi generals would be like ripping, but like, uh, oh, yes, blow that up, you know, kind of thing. <laughs> uh, right. They never said no, you know, kind of thing. They're just like, oh, okay. Mike, sure. Would you like some tea? I'm like, no, nah, I'm good, man. It's cool. You know, so you walk <laughs> back to the other side, uh, you know, just strike stuff. I think at one point in Ramadi, we were essentially bombing street to street. Like guys would get in at six in the morning, bomb three blocks, get off, 
for the night, like three or four blocks would get bombed and they'd pick up like just bombing the next three or four blocks and they're just like leveling the city like a street at a time. It was nuts. Jeez. Yeah. Cause there's just that many guys running around. It was just, you know, and it was funny too. Cause they did, you know, like walking in military formations, driving military vehicles, like weren't trying to hide at all. And then, you know, like all day long getting bombed and they just kept doing it. It's crazy. So weird. Yeah. Like you think they like at least give up or hide or you know try to blend to in or different? <laughs> right, yeah. yeah. Maybe they thought that was the last one. Like, ah, oh, surely they won't keep doing this. Yeah. Just, that'll be the last one. Nope, no. Nope. And then just, yeah, I think we I think we destroyed Iraqi oil production for a while because like at first you know we first got there and I was like, hey, don't don't drop in the Beijing oil fields. And then by the time we were leaving, they were like shucking two thousand pounders all over the refinery because like they oh, kind of figured out that we weren't bombing in the refinery, so they started massing in the refinery and then. Uh, we want to blow on the crap out of that thing. So what you said something about the Brits? If you if you uh, Winchester to Brit, yeah, so they the would. Uh, Brit guys were awesome because they I don't know where they lived, but wherever they lived, they'd send a bottle of champagne every time you Winchester them. Yeah, it, you know, of course you're supposed to be on Geo One and all that stuff, and you know, like, yeah, okay, cool, whatever. And you know, every time <laughs> it was a nice bottle of champagne, it was that like Vivu Cliquet or whatever, you know? Uh, yeah. So it wasn't, it wasn't anything cheap either. And they just kept sending them. So like New Year's, uh, that year was pretty, uh, pretty good. We, we celebrated pretty heavily. And the funny thing was too, like if you were on the embassy, they had like the Diplomart thing and you could go in there and uh, buy all kinds of stuff, ignoring which sport we're supposed to. So if guys, sh- if those guys showed up, you were like, all right, let's, let's get these guys as much off like, as possible. You prioritize <laughs> them and then got everything off them. You know, because like <laughs> when they would come to us at the strike cells, they could actually drop because it was the weird, like, are we thing? If they had a US JTAC and they're supporting the US, they could drop, where if they were with a British JTAC, they couldn't because they had different ROEs or something. You know what I mean? It was some weird uh-huh. relationship like that. Um, but yeah, so they definitely like working with us. And I think, I think I told you about that too. I, about halfway through the deployment, I wound up uh, uh, stealing the Iraqi prime minister's chair. Oh yeah. <laughs> I didn't I didn't realize I did it at the time. Uh so <laughs> the general's aide, we, we had a briefing that morning and like I was living in at that point we'd gotten kicked out of the apartments that were nice on the MC, so they put us in the C Lane case. So I was in like a uh, you know, like the back of the box truck, the ten by twenties. So I was one of those by myself because the guy that I was living with was like, Oh hey, I'm leaving. Can you turn my key in? I'm like, You bet, bud. Never turned that key in. No. Uh, so, yeah. yeah, so no roommate. Um so then I went to the ASOC, got their big projector for their maps they use because they weren't using one of them. So I got one of those, set it up. We would have movies in there. And I'm like, I was looking for a good chair to have a uh, movie night with. And we had a big briefing because they were doing some big op uh, with the Iraqis. And I think this is like right about the time they got their F-16s or something. So it was like this big to-do. Um, and we went in the briefing. I hadn't been in there yet because it was like kind of on a lock and key. And I went to the general's aid. I was like, hey, man, um, can I get the code to that room? I left some stuff in there. It's like after the thing breaks up, because I've, I've seen all the chairs. I'm like, oh, I'll definitely get one of those. <laughs> right. And I didn't realize it. I'd, I'd you know, get this chair out, throw it in the back of the Tahoe, bring it over to the uh, embassy side, put it in my hooch. And then we were having another briefing the next day. General Zayn was like, flip it out. He's like, where's the prime minister's chair? And I'm like, <laughs> yeah, my bad. <laughs> So. Did you give it back or did you Absolutely just like, not. I, no, no, okay, good. good. No. Yeah. There was, at that point it was too far <laughs> gone. And like, you know, people kind of like got into a tizzy about it. And I'm like, I'm not letting on. Cause I knew it was across the street at the embassy and none of those yeah. guys were going to see it. So I'm like, I- I'm safe. Uh, yeah. It would have been worse probably if you had Rogered up and said, oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. So I unwittingly stole the, uh, Iraqi prime minister's chair, which is pretty funny. <laughs> So you did, uh, wait, I, and I didn't know this part. You, so when you were done with the 14th, did you go, you went into the guard after you got out of the 14th? No, so I actually went to the National Assessment Group. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, selectively staffed organization, I guess you could say. Um, we worked. Uh, yeah, I'm not familiar with that. Okay. We did uh, test and eval for stuff. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, okay. Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, it was awesome, man. It was a really unique peek behind their curtain because we were held at the OSD level. It wasn't just service, like, you know, Air Force stuff I was looking at. Like, there was Navy stuff, Marine stuff, uh, Army stuff, other organization stuff, you know, so it was it was pretty wild. And then it was, it was pretty neat, you know, because you get to see all the newest stuff. And it's funny because now some of the stuff we were testing, you know, years ago is 
getting put into service now and some of the things that yeah, yeah. put into service since. And it's just funny to see that because, you know, you get it very early on as technology and you're like, you know, you're deciding whether this stuff's viable or not. And it's pretty, pretty wild to, you know, make those decisions. You see, you know, stuff come out a couple of years later and you're like, wow, I, I tested that like three years ago. So <laughs> it's it pretty cool. Uh, definitely a uh, good assignment. Uh, yeah. Learned, learned a ton, learned how to do project management, learned how to spend money for the government, which is pretty cool. Got to travel all over the world, which is awesome. There was like, you know, a couple of projects I had that you had to do them overseas. So like, you'd have to go to Germany for like six weeks or go to Spain for like six weeks, which was terrible. Nice. Um, yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, it's a horrible. Poverty, I'm going to Spain for six weeks. Yeah. Oh my um, God. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so we did that. And then um, it was time to leave the NAG. Um, I didn't really want to retire out of there. Uh, so I... Muller had hit me up and he's like, Hey man, I'm getting ready to leave Syracuse. Are you looking for something? And I'm like, yeah. So I applied over there, got the job in, um, Syracuse. So, uh, as an ops suit and wound up doing a couple of years there and, and retiring. But the cool thing was, is I got to, uh, so my brother right before that had gotten back in, got into the air force oh, yeah. and went TACP. Right. Um, so it's, you know, it's not every day you're, uh, brother grows up to want to be just like you right and especially your older brother too huh? right right yeah so he uh i was like you're crazy dude but if you want to do it man get after it and you know at 49 years old i think he's like the oldest guy that's ever been through tacky training and, and made it you know kind of stuff so it was pretty it has crazy. to be i mean yeah. 49 going through that course i mean that's it crazy is, it's not the course we went through either like they they do yeah a lot more now so he did the whole prep selection schoolhouse you know a whole bit it was pretty nuts and then the cool thing was he was out of 274 so me and him like uh were in the same unit for like two years so that was pretty cool oh nice yeah so when i got to retire he was you know he was um part of my retirement center and everything too which was pretty cool and he was in the army before right yeah so he was a yeah. uh medic then he switched over to be an engineer when he got commissioned uh did a one-year deployment to afghanistan at um fog wilderness okay yeah so you, you got you had some pretty good uh pretty good stories out of there too so yeah yeah, yeah. that's awesome yeah and uh yeah they decided to retire at uh in the middle of the pandemic and uh yeah that was a, a gong <laughs> show because like i was trying to get a place to have retirement it was like oh we can't we can't open up we can't have that many people so i said screw it call the place got a circus tent put it in my backyard uh you know, and it snowed like two days before because I retired in April. So it snowed in Massachusetts like two days before. We got the heaters in there, like dried off the ground inside. And it was like a freak heat wave came through. It was like 60 degrees, melted all the snow like the day before um, the retirement ceremony. It was just, it was nuts. And, you know, it was funny too because like the last thing I did was uh, I got everyone good too in my retirement. So I, we had about 200 chairs. And on every chair, I taped one of those little bottles of uh, apple pie moonshine. Uh -huh. So I taped them all under there. And then, you know, as I'm like finishing up, I'm like, hey, I got one more thing I'm going to do. Um, you know, if everyone can just reach under the seat and you, there'll be something under there. And, you know, as I'm at the podium, I see all these like confused faces. I'm like, just reach under. All right. You know, I see my mom sitting there. I'm like, that means you, mom. You know, so I made her <laughs> reach under the seat and grab it. And they're all like, oh, come on. So I did the tack beat toast. And that was like the last thing I did. And I ended the ceremony. It was funny. So. Nice. Nice way to go out for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. So then, so you retired and then what, so tell me about like when you got out, like what did you do? What was your first thing you did when you got out and what have you been doing since then? Yeah. So I, um, before I even retired, you know, uh, started looking for jobs, um, put my resume up on clearance jobs and I didn't even apply for anything. People started calling me. Um, nice. you know, so I started getting fielded a bunch of phone calls and then finally, uh, aerial networks division at Hanscom says, Hey, we need a tactical data link speed. Do you want to do it? I'm like, sure. Why not? You know, I've been, because I, uh, done some of the testing on the, uh, 161. So that handheld link 16. So I got obviously through that test. Cause like, a, uh, it was almost like a two year test. Like I got really smart on data links. Um, nice. So, uh, I wound up doing that for about two years. And then here recently, um, one of the guys, interestingly enough that I was testing one of their products for something else, he calls me out of the blue. He's like, Hey man, are you looking for a job? I'm like, I'm not looking, but what do you got? And, um, you know, I got offered a senior product manager job at, uh, Galveon. 
which is a, you know, the company they make helmets uh, and then they do hubs and cables. So like, you know, all that stuff for it, like an ATAC. So the hubs and cables that do all your ATAC stuff. Oh yeah. yeah. All that, and then power management stuff. So yeah, it's been a pretty, it's been a great job. You know, I've been there almost a year now, I guess. Yeah. Crap. November would be a year. Nice. So it was definitely, definitely a nice move, uh, you know, into those guys that, you know, think your network isn't anything, man. Like you gotta keep that network going. You gotta keep building it and, you know, maintain those contacts because you know you never know when someone's going to call out of the blue and offer you a really good job or you know just having that fallback too right right um, but it's been awesome and then um you know other things i've gotten into so um as i moved back into my hometown uh, thankfully i got a house right before i got priced out of the community uh, <laughs> i kind of noticed some things going on you know and like i was like i don't really like the way this is going you know like i started looking at school budgets and stuff like that and got really frustrated with the way they were doing things, you know, so I started to speak up at meetings that wasn't going anywhere. So I said, you know what, I'm just gonna run for election. So I ran for election last year, uh, didn't make it, I think it was like 100 votes short. And this year, I wound up getting elected nice. uh, by 85 votes. So it's been it's been really cool. So you know, a lot, a lot of stuff and get a lot of input there. And I don't know, just dipping my toe into government, you know, we'll, we'll see where it goes from there. But it's been pretty rewarding there. And you know, we're, we're, like, I'm having a say on a couple of schools are building in town. You know, I get to say on, you know, how we're going to do stuff, which is, which is really nice, you know, again, because, uh, you know, it's one of those things, if you're not going to be part of the solution, you're part of the problem. Right. So I figured out put my money where my mouth is and get involved, which it's, it's been, a, it's been a good experience since, and, you know, like that's another thing, you know, I, I would uh, tell guys to explore, man, like, you know, get out of your comfort zone, do things you don't think were possible or, you know, things that you never really thought of, uh, cause it's, you know, you can have some rewarding experiences out of it. You know, it's, it's good getting tied back into my community cause I was gone for 24 years. So, um, you know, I getting tied back in here and then along with that, uh, <clears throat> I got really active in the veteran community. So, um, I'm the historian at the Legion in my town, um, the secretary at the VFW. Um, and I'm also the Sergeant arms at the Legion riders for my post too. So, you know, nice. a lot of, charity motorcycle rides and stuff like that, which is really good. Um, you know, it's, uh, and of course being part of the legions and the DFW is good too, because you need to do that community outreach and, you know, help out guys that, um, need stuff. And it's just nice, man. Like, you know, be, you know, one of the, cause in my town, there's not, not a huge military presence. Right. So like a lot of the, uh, especially the DFW members are a lot older mm-hmm. and, you know, so they, it, it's just really nice to help them out, you know, cause they have, you know, they get a need and, you know, we can help them out, which is, you know, pretty rewarding, right? You know, those yeah. guys are like old war two guys and Korea guys, you know, getting into the Vietnam guys now, which is kind of weird, uh, you know, because the, you know, world war two guys are kind of like not really there anymore. Sure. Uh, so yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's been, it's been good. You know, I've been getting involved there and then, you know, as part of that, I, uh, kicked, I, uh, crossed off a bucket list item this year, went to uh, Normandy for D-Day. Oh, right on. Yeah. It was pretty awesome. Um, and actually I met up with Bobby Penn. Oh, really? So Bobby, like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, we met up. We uh, we stayed in St. Marigli's. I was across the street from the church where the paratrooper got stuck. Oh, yeah. On, on the roof, so it was pretty wild. And then <laughs> um, I think the coolest part of the trip is one of Bobby's friends um, as part of one of the jump teams. And then invited us along because he knew, you know, we knew we were jumpers or whatever. He invited us along on um, the night of the June 5th and the June 6th. Um, he invited us out to drop zone alpha because they had a little small ceremony out there. And then you know, there's like 30 dudes by cell phone light at midnight. Oh one, when the first paratrooper supposedly left the door, uh, we all did a memorial shot, uh, on drop zone alpha. So it was pretty, oh, that's pretty cool awesome. to be part of that. You know, yeah. uh, and it was, you know, it was like a small intimate crowd too, you know, so it was, wasn't like a big, you know, cause most of the stuff at D-Day there, especially in St. Mayor and, and, you know, Omaha, Utah around that time is very touristy. Yeah. yeah. And it wasn't, you know, it was just like, you know, 30, 30, uh, 30 guys at midnight. So that was pretty cool. Oh man. That'd have been super cool. And, but, uh, you're also the TACP association Northeast yeah. rep, right? Okay. Yeah. So. TACP a Northeast rep. Yeah. Also so if anybody, uh, anybody listening is like, has any issues or, you know, wants to reach out, you're the guy up there in the Northeast. So that's good. Yeah. Yeah. So me and Josh, Josh Adams are the, uh, two Northeast reps. So okay. basically new England, New Jersey, New York, um, can't remember. There's a couple more states, but yeah, pretty much anywhere northeast is us. So if you got any needs, by all means, reach out. I'm, I'm here to help. And you know, even if it's just you want to 
BS or something or talk about life, dude. Whatever, uh, whatever folks need, man. That's awesome. Well, this has been great, man. This is, oh man, I, I knew it was going to be this way, and uh, I, I can't thank you enough for coming on here and, and uh, sharing all this stuff. I mean, it's really, I, you and I have interacted a lot, um, but it wasn't to the point of all of this stuff. So I'm glad I got to hear all these details and all these stories. I mean, it's really cool. And uh, it's good catching up with you, man. It's, I haven't seen you in so long, so it's been nice to, you know, touch base and all that. For sure. No, definitely great catching up. And thanks for having me. I really appreciate the, uh, you know, the invite and everything. And I, I think it's awesome what you're doing, you know, capturing all the tacky history and, you know, getting the uh, uh, firsthand accounts because that's one of the things I, you know, again, started to realize was uh, as those World War II vets are, you know, no longer with us, you know, in Normandy, it's like, you know, some of these stories that they had will never be captured. And you're really doing that, making a history attack piece. It's pretty, pretty awesome what you're doing, man. I, I really appreciate it. Yeah. It's, uh, I, I think that, um, I think it's important, you know, to kind of get exposed, not only just capture them, but like expose people to these stories as well. Like they, I think our attack P career field has been kind of under the radar for a long time. And, uh, and there's so many guys like you and, you know, all the guys I've talked to are just, there's so many good dudes out there that, yeah, I think some, they need a little recognition, I think, for what they do. Definitely. All right, brother. Well, again, I can't thank you enough for coming on here. This was great. Um, I appreciate it. And, uh, yeah, keep in touch and uh, let me know what you're up to. Yeah, for sure. Take it easy. And uh, thanks for everything, man. Hey!